Chapter Twenty One of All Along the River. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. All Along the River by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter Twenty One. The woods are round us, heaped and dim. It was their last day at San Remo. Everything had been packed for the journey, and the drawing-room at Lauterbrunnen had a dreary look now that it was stripped of all those decorations and useful prettinesses with which Allegra had made it so gay and homelike. The morning was brilliant, and Martin, Allegra, and Captain Halbert set off at nine o'clock upon a long deferred expedition to San Romolo. They would be home in good time for the eight o'clock dinner, and Isola promised to amuse herself all day, and to be in good spirits to welcome them on their return. "'You have a duty to do for your sister,' she said, when her husband felt compunction at leaving her. "'Think of all she has done for us, her devotion, her unselfishness. The least we can do is to help her to be happy with her lover, and all the burden of that duty has fallen upon you. I think you ought to be called Colonel Gooseberry. She looked a bright and happy creature as she stood on the mule path in the olive wood, waving her hand to them as they went away, Allegra riding a donkey, the two men walking, one on each side of her bridle, and the guide striding on ahead, leading a second donkey, which was to serve as an occasional help by and by if either of the pedestrians wanted a lift. Her cheeks were flushed with walking, and her eyes were bright with a new gladness. She was full of a childish pleasure in the idea of their journey, and the realisation of a dream which most of us have dreamt a long time before it assumed the shape of earthly things, the dream of Rome. Isola stood listening to their footsteps, as they passed the little painted shrine on the hill path. She heard them give the time of day to a party of peasant women, with empty baskets on their heads, going up to gather the last of the olives. Then she roamed about the wooded valley and the slope of the hill towards Colla for an hour or two, and then, growing suddenly tired, she crept home, in time to sit beside her baby, while he slept his placid noontide sleep. She bent over the little rosebud mouth and kissed it, in a rapture of maternal love. So young to see Rome, she murmured, and to think that those star-like eyes will see and take no heed, to think that such a glorious vision will pass before him, and he will remember nothing. The day was very long, something like one of those endless days at Trelasco, when her husband was in Burma, and she had only the dog and the cat for her companions. She thought of those fond friends to-day with a regretful sigh. The sleepy Shah, so calm and undemonstrative in his attachment, but with a placid, purring delight in her society, which seemed to mean a great deal. The fox terrier, so active and intense in his affection, demanding so much attention, intruding himself upon her walks and reveries with such eager, not to be denied, devotion. She had no four-footed friends here, and the want of them made an empty space in her life. In the afternoon the weather changed suddenly, the sky became overcast, the sea a leaden colour and the mistral came whistling up the valley with a great rustling and shivering of the silver-green foliage and creaking of the old bent branches, like the withered arms of witch or sorceress. All the glory of the day was gone, and the white villas on the crest of the eastward hill stood out in livid distinctness against the blackened sky. Isola wandered up the hill-path, past the little shrine where the way divided, the point at which she had seen her husband and his party vanish in the sunny morning. 
she felt a sudden sense of loneliness now the sun was gone a childish longing for the return of her friends for evening and lamplight and the things that make for cheerfulness she was cold and dull and out of spirits she had left the house while the sun was shining and she had come without shawl or wrap of any kind and the mistral made her shiver yet she had no idea of hurrying home the loneliness of the house had become oppressive before she left it and she knew there would be some hours to wait for the return of the excursionists so she mounted the steep mule path slowly and painfully till she had gone two-thirds of the way to collar and then she sat down to rest on the low stone wall which enclosed a little garden in a break of the wood from which point there was a far-stretching view seaward she was very cold but she was so tired as to be glad to rest at any hazard of after suffering drowsy from sheer exhaustion she leant her head against a great rugged olive whose roots were mixed up with the wall and fell fast asleep she awoke shivering from a confused dream of sea and woods roman temples and ruined palaces she had been wandering in one of those dream cities that have neither limit nor settled locality it was here in the woods below colla and yet was half rome and half trelasco there was a classic temple upon a hill that was like the mount and the day was bleak and dark and rainy and she was walking on the footpath through lord lostwithiel's park with the storm-driven rain beating against her face just as on that autumn evening when the owner of the soil had taken compassion upon her and had given her shelter the dream had been curiously vivid a dream which brought the past back as if it were the present and blotted out all that had come afterwards she woke bewildered forgetting that her husband had come back from india and that she was in italy thinking of herself as she had been that october evening when she and lostwithiel met for the first time the sea was darker than when she fell asleep there was the dull crimson of a stormy sunset yonder behind the jutting promontory of bordeghera while the sky above was barred with long black clouds and the wind was howling across the great deep valley like an evil spirit tortured and imprisoned shrieking to his gods for release exactly opposite her as she stood in the deep cleft of the hills a solitary vessel was labouring under press of canvas towards the point upon whose dusky summit the chapel of the madonna della guardia gleamed whitely in the dying day the vessel was a schooner yacht of considerable tonnage certainly larger than the vendetta isola stood still as marble watching that labouring boat the straining sails the dark hull beaten by the stormy dash of the waves she watched with wide open eyes and parted lips quivering as with an overmastering fear watched in momentary expectation of seeing those straining sails dip for the last time that labouring hull founder and vanish betwixt black wave and white surf she watched in motionless attention till the boat disappeared behind the shoulder of the hill and then shivering nervous and altogether overstrung she hurried homewards feeling that she had stayed out much too long and that she had caught a chill which might be the cause of new trouble if those narrow mule paths had been less familiar she might have lost her way in the dusk but she had trodden them too often to be in any difficulty and she reached the villa without loss of time but not before the return of the picnic party allegra and captain hulbert were watching at the gate colonel disney had gone into the wood to look for her and had naturally taken the wrong direction 
Oh, it's Zola. How could you stop out so late, and on such a stormy evening? remonstrated Allegra. I fell asleep before the storm came on. Fell asleep, out of doors, and at sunset? What dreadful imprudence! I went out too late, I'm afraid, but I was so tired of waiting for you. A kind of horror of the house and the silence came upon me, and I felt I must go out into the woods. I walked too far, and fell asleep from sheer fatigue, and when I woke I saw a yacht fighting with the wind. I'm afraid she'll go down. What? You noticed her too? exclaimed Halbert. I didn't think you cared enough about yachts to take notice of her. I was watching her as we came down the hill. Rather too much canvas. But she's right enough. She's past Arma di Taggia by this time, I dare say. I'll go and look for Disney, and tell him you are safe and sound. Perhaps I shall miss him in the wood. It's like a midsummer night's dream, isn't it, Allegra? He said, laughing, as he went out of the gate. If it were only midsummer, I shouldn't care, answered his sweetheart, with her arm around Isola, who stood beside her, pale and shivering. Come in, dear, and let me make you warm, if I can. If they should all go down in the darkness, said Isola, in a low, dreamy voice, the boat looked as if it might be wrecked at any moment. Allegra employed all her arts as a sick nurse in the endeavour to ward off any evil consequence from that imprudent slumber in the chill hour of sunset. But her cares were unavailing. Isola was restless and feverish all night, yet she insisted on getting up at her usual hour next morning, and declared herself quite capable of the journey to Genoa. Allegra and her brother, however, insisted on her resting for a day or two, so the departure was postponed, and the doctor sent for. He advised at least three days' rest, with careful nursing, and he reproved his patient severely for her imprudence in exposing herself to the evening air. Captain Halbert appeared at tea-time, just returned from a railway journey to Alassio. "'I have a surprise for you, Mrs. Disney,' he said, seating himself by the sofa where Isola was lying, surrounded by invalid luxuries, books, lemonade, fan, and eau de cologne flask, her feet covered with a silken rug. "'Surprise?' she echoed faintly, as if life held no surprises for her. "'What can that be?' "'You remember the yacht you saw last night?' "'Yes!' she cried, roused in an instant, and clasping her hands excitedly. "'Did she go down?' "'Not the least little bit. She is safe and sound at Alassio. She is called the Eurydice. She hails last from Syracuse, and my brother is on board her. He wired to me this morning to go over and see him. I'm very glad I went, for he is off to Corfu to-morrow.' The flying Dutchman isn't in it with him. There was a curious silence. Martin Disney was sitting on the other side of his wife's sofa, where he had been reading selected bits of the Times, such portions of the news of men and nations as he fancied might interest her. Allegra was busy with a piece of delicate needlework, and did not immediately reply. But it was she who was first to speak. How frightened you would have been yesterday evening had you known who was on board the boat, she said. I don't know about being frightened, but he was certainly carrying too much canvas. I told him so this morning. What did he say? Laughed at me. You sailors never believe that a landsman can sail a ship, he said. I wanted to talk to his sailing master, but he told me he was his own sailing master. If his ship was doomed to go down, he meant to be at the helm himself. That sounds as if he were foolhardy, said Allegra. I told him I did not like the rig of his boat, nor the name of his boat, and I reminded him how I saw the Eurydice of Portland, with all her canvas spread the day she went down. 
I was with the governor of the prison, a naval man, who had been commander on my first ship, and we stood side by side on the cliff, and watched her as she went by. If this wind gets much stronger, that ship will go down, said my old captain, unless they take in some of their canvas. And a few hours later, those poor fellows had all gone to the bottom. I asked Lostwithiel why he called his boat the Eurydice. Fancy, he said. He had a fancy for the name. I've never forgotten the old lines we used to hammer out when we were boys, he said. Ah, miseram, Eurydice, anima fugiente vocabat, Eurydice toto referebant flumine ripe. I don't think the name matters, if she is a good boat said allegra with her calm common sense well she is and she isn't she is a finer boat than the vendetta but i'd sooner handle the vendetta in a storm there are points about his new boat that i don't quite like however he had her built by one of the finest builders on the clyde and it will be hard if she goes wrong he has given me the vendetta as a wedding present in advance of the event on condition that I sink her when I'm tired of her. And he said he hoped she'd be luckier to me than she had been to him. Martin Disney sat silent by his wife's sofa. He could never hear Lord Lostwithiel's name without a touch of pain. His only objection to Halbert as a brother-in-law was the thought that the two men were of the same race, that he must needs hear the hated name from time to time and yet he believed his wife's avowal that she was pure and true his hatred of the name came only from the recollection that she had been slandered by a man whom he despised he looked at the wasted profile on the satin pillow so wan so transparent in its waxen pallor the heavy eyelid drooping languidly the faintly coloured lips drawn as if with pain a broken lily was this the kind of woman to be suspected of evil this fair and fragile creature in whom the spiritual so predominated over the sensual he hated himself for having been for a moment influenced by that underbred scoundrel at glenaveril for having been base enough to doubt his wife's purity he had pained and humiliated her and now the stamp of death was on the face he adored, and before him lay the prospect of a life's remorse. They left San Remo three days afterwards, Isola being pronounced able to bear the journey, though her cough had been considerably increased by that imprudent slumber in the wood. She was anxious to go, and doctor and husband gave way to her eagerness for new scenes. I am so tired of this place, she said piteously. It is lovely, but it is a loveliness that makes me melancholy. I want to be in a great city where there are lots of people moving about. I have never lived in a city, but always in quiet places. Beautiful, very beautiful, but so still, so still, so full of oneself and one's own thoughts. End of chapter 21Chapter twenty two Ecco Roma. The agent had proved himself worthy of trust, and had chosen the lodging for Colonel Disney's family with taste and discretion. It was a first floor over a jeweller's shop in a short street, behind the Piazza di Spagna and under the Pincian Gardens. There were not too many stairs for Isola to ascend when she came in from her drive or walk. The gardens were close at hand and all around there were trees and flowers, 
and an atmosphere of verdure and retirement in the midst of the great cosmopolitan city it was dark when the train came into the terminus and isola was weary and exhausted after the long hot journey from pisa the glare of the sun and the suffocating clouds of dust and the beautiful monotony of blue sea and sandy plains long level wastes where nothing grew but brushwood and osier and stretches of marshy ground with water pools shining here and there like burnished steel and distant islets dimly seen athwart a cloud of heat then evening closed in and it was through a grey and formless world that they approached the city whose very name thrilled her the railway station was very much like any other great terminus like milan like genoa there was the same close rank of omnibuses there were the same blue blouses and civil eager porters far too few for the work to be done rapacious but amiable piling up the innumerable packages of the italian traveller loading themselves like so many human beasts of burden and with no apparent limit to their capacity for carrying things two flies were packed with the miscellaneous luggage nurses and baby and then isola was handed to her place in another with allegra by her side and through the narrow streets of tall houses under the dim strip of soft april night she drove through the city of heroes and martyrs saints and apostles wicked emperors and holy women the city of historical contrasts of darkness and light refinement and barbarism of all things most unlike each other from nero to paul from gregory the great to the borgias the glory and the beauty of rome only began to dawn upon her the next morning in the vivid sunlight when she climbed the steps of the trinità de monti and then with allegra's arm to lean upon went slowly upward and again upward to the topmost terrace on the pincian hill and stood leaning on the marble balustrade and gazing across the city that lay steeped in sunshine at her feet over palace and steeple pinnacle and tower to the rugged grandeur of hadrian's tomb and to that great dome whose vastness makes all other temples seem puny and insignificant this was her first view of the world's greatest church the air was clear and cool upon this height although the city below showed dimly through a hazy veil of almost tropical heat everywhere there was the odour of summer flowers the overpowering sweetness of lilies of the valley and great branches of lilac white and purple brimming over in the baskets of the flower sellers on such a morning as this one could understand how the romans came to call april the joyous month and to dedicate this season of sunshine and flowers to the goddess of beauty and love isola's face lighted up with a new gladness a look of perfect absorption and self-forgetfulness as she leant upon the balustrade and gazed across that vast panorama gazed and wondered with eyes that seemed to grow larger in their delight and this is really rome she murmured softly yes this is rome cried allegra isn't it lovely isn't it all you ever dreamt of or hoped for and yet people have so maligned it called it feverish stuffy disappointing dirty why the air is ether inspiring health-giving april in rome is as fresh as april in an english forest only it is april with the warmth and flowers of june i feel sure you will grow ever so much stronger after one little week in rome yes i know i shall be better here i feel better already said isola with a kind of feverish hopefulness it was so good of martin to bring me san remo is always lovely and i should love it to the end of my life because it was my first home in italy but i was beginning to be tired not of the olive woods and the sea but of the people we met and the sameness of life 
one day was so like another twas monotonous of course agreed allegra and being a little out of health you would be bored by monotony sooner than martin or i it was such a pity you did not like the yacht that made such a change for us the very olive woods and the mountain villages seem new when one sees them from the water i was never tired of looking at the hills between san remo and bordighera or the promontory of monaco with its cathedral towers it was a pleasure lost to you dear but it could not be helped i suppose yet once upon a time tempting danger round by neptune point i may have been stronger then isola faltered oh forgive me darling what an inconsiderate wretch i am but rome will give you back your lost strength and we shall round neptune point again and feel the salt spray dashing over our heads as we go out into the great fierce atlantic i confess that sometimes when that divine mediterranean which we are never tired of worshipping has been lying in the sunshine like one vast floor of lapis lazuli i have longed for something rougher and wilder for such a sea as you and i have watched from the rashly mausoleum colonel disney and his wife and sister went about in a very leisurely way in their explorations in the first place he was anxious to avoid anything approaching fatigue for his wife and in the second place it was only the beginning of april and they were to be in rome for at least a month there was therefore no need for rushing hither and thither at the tourist pace with guide-books in their hands and anxious heated countenances perspiring through the streets and suffering deadly chills in the churches allegra's first desire was naturally to see the picture galleries and to these she went for the most part alone leaving isola and her husband free to wander about as they pleased upon a friendly equality of ignorance knowing very little more than child harold and murray could teach them isola's rome was byron's rome there was one spot she loved better than any other in the city of mighty memories it was not hallowed by the blood of saint or hero sage or martyr it had no classical associations he whose heart lay buried there under the shadow of the tribune's mighty monument perished in the pride of manhood in the freshness and glory of life and that heart so warm and generous to his fellow-men had hardened itself against the god of saint and martyr the god of peter and paul lawrence and gregory benedict and augustine yet for isola there was no grave in rome so fraught with spiritual thoughts as shelley's grave no sweeter memory associated with the eternal city than the memory of his wanderings and meditations amidst the ruined walls of the baths of caracalla where his young genius drank in the poetry of the long past and fed upon the story of the antique dead she came to shelley's grave as often as she could steal away from the anxious companions of her drives and walks i like to be alone now and then she told her husband it rests me to sit by myself for an hour or two in this lovely place there was a coachman in the piazza who was in the habit of driving colonel disney's family an elderly man sober steady and attentive with intelligence that made him almost as good as a guide he was on the watch for his english clients every morning they had but to appear on the piazza and he was in attendance ready to take them to the utmost limit of a day's journey if they liked were they in doubt where to go he was always prompt with suggestions he would drive isola to the door of the english cemetery leave her there and return at her bidding to take her home again disney knew she was safe when this veteran had her in charge the man was well known in the piazza and of established character for honesty she took a book or two in her light basket buying a handful of flowers here and there from the women and children as she went along 
till the books were hidden under roses and lilac the custodian of the cemetery knew her and admitted her without a word he had watched her furtively once or twice to see that she neither gathered the flowers nor tried to scratch her name upon the tombs he had seen her sitting quietly by the slab which records shelley's death and the death of that faithful friend who was laid beside him sixty years afterwards sixty years of loving regretful memory and then union in the dust shall there not be a later and a better meeting when those two shall see each other's faces and hear each other's voices again in a world where old things shall be made new where youth and its wild freshness shall come back again and trelawney shall be as young in thought and feeling as shelley the english burial place was a garden of fairest flowers at this season a paradise of roses and clematis azaleas and camellias and much more beautiful for its wilder growth of trailing foliage and untended shrubs the pale cold blue of the periwinkle that carpeted slope and bank and for the background of old grey wall severe in its antique magnificence a cyclopean rampart relic of time immemorial clothed and beautified with weed and floweret that grew in every cleft and cranny here in a sheltered angle to the left of the poet's grave isola could sit unobserved even when the custodian brought a party of tourists to see the hallowed spot which occurred now and then while she sat there the tourists for the most part stared foolishly made some sentimental remark if they were women or if they were men betrayed a hopeless ignorance of the poet's history and not unfrequently confounded him with keats isola sat half hidden in her leafy corner where the ivy and the acanthus hung from the great grey buttress against which she leant languid half dreaming with two books on her lap one was her shelley her much read Shelley, a shabby cloth bound volume, bought in her girlhood at the booksellers in the Place du Gesselin, where English books could be got by special order and at special prices. The other was an Italian testament, which her husband had bought her at San Remo, and in which she had read with extreme diligence and with increasing fervour as her mind became more deeply moved by father rodwell's sermons it was not that she had ever been one of those advanced thinkers who will accept no creed which does not square with their own little theories and fit into their own narrow circle of possibilities she had never doubted the creed she had been taught in her childhood but she had thought very little about serious things since she was a young girl preparing for her confirmation touched with girlish enthusiasm and very much in earnest in these fair spring days and in this city of many memories all young thoughts had reawakened in her mind she pored over the familiar gospel stories and again as in the first freshness of her girlhood she saw the sacred figure of the redeemer and teacher in all the vivid light and colour of a reality close at hand faith stretched a hand across the abyss of time and brought the old world of the gospel story close to her the closer because she was in rome not far from that church which enshrines the print of the divine footstep when he who was god and man appeared to his disciple to foreshadow approaching martyrdom to inspire the fortitude of the martyr yes although the saviour's earthly feet never entered the city every hill and every valley within and without those crumbling walls has interwoven itself so closely with the story of his life through the work of his saints and martyrs that it is nowise strange if the scenes and images of the sacred story seem nearer and more vivid in rome than in any other place on earth not excepting jerusalem it was from rome not from jerusalem that the cross went out to the uttermost ends of the world 
it is the earth of the Colosseum and the borgo that is steeped in the blood of those who have died for christ it was rome that ruled the world through the long night of barbarism and feudal power by the invincible force of his name it might seem strange that isola should turn from the story of the evangelists to the works of a poet whose human sympathies were so wrung by the evil that has been wrought in the name of the cross that he was blind to the infinitely greater good which christianity has accomplished for mankind shelley saw the blood of the martyrs not as a sublime testimony to the godlike power of faith not as a sacrifice rich in afterfruits sad seed of a joyous harvest but as the brutal outcome of man's cruelty using any name christ or buddha mahomet or brahma as the badge of tyranny the sanction to torture and to slay shelley's melancholy fate seemed brought nearer to her now that she sat beside his grave in the summer stillness and in the shadow of the old aurelian wall it was only his heart that was lying there the imperishable heart snatched by trelawney's hand from the flame of the greek pyre from the smoke of pine logs and frankincense wine and oil sixty years had passed before that hand lay cold in the grave beside the buried heart of the poet sixty years of severance and fond faithful memory before death brought reunion what a beautiful spirit this which was so early quenched by the cruellest stroke of fate a light such as seldom shone out of mortal clay a spirit of fire and brightness intangible untamable not to be shut within common limits nor judged by common laws end of chapter 22「of the people who came to look upon the grave some lay a tributary flower upon the stone and some to pluck a leaf or two of acanthus or violet all hitherto had been strangers to isola had gone away without seeing her or had glanced indifferently as at one more unfortunate with a sketching block spoiling paper in the pursuit of the unattainable there were so many amateur artists sitting about in the outskirts of the city that such a figure in a romantic spot challenged nobody's attention so far people had come and gone and had taken no notice but one afternoon a figure in a long black cassock came suddenly between her and the golden light and isola looked up with a cry of surprise on recognizing father rodwell you did not expect to see me here he said holding out his hand she had risen from her seat on the low grassy bank and she gave him her hand half in pleasure half in a nervous apprehension which his keen eye was quick to perceive his life had been spent in dealings with the souls of men and women and he had learnt to read those living pages as easily as he read plato or spinoza no she said i had no idea you were in rome you told us you were going back to london i meant to go back to london and hard work but my doctor insisted upon my prolonging my holiday for a few weeks so i came here instead rome always draws me and is always new rome gives me fresh life and fresh power when my heart and brain have been feeling benumbed and dead i am glad they brought you here mrs disney you were looking languid and ill when you left san remo i hope rome has revivified you he looked at her earnestly her face had been in shadow until now but as she moved into the sunlight 
he saw that the lines had sharpened in the pale wan face and that there was the stamp of wasting disease in the hollow cheeks and about the sunken eyes and in the almost bloodless lips as he looked at her in friendliest commiseration those pathetic grey eyes whose expression had baffled his power of interpretation hitherto filled suddenly with tears and in the next moment she clasped her hands before her face in an agony of grief the italian testament which she had been reading when he approached dropped at her feet and stooping to pick it up father rodwell saw that it was open at the fourth chapter of st john the story of the woman of samaria the sinner with whom christ talked at the well a leaf from shelley's grave lay upon the book as if to mark where isola had been reading and father rodwell's quick glance saw that the page was blotted with tears my dear mrs disney he said gently is there anything wrong at home your husband your boy are well i hope yes thank god they are both well god has been very good to me he might have taken those i love he has been merciful he is merciful to all his creatures though there are times when his dealings with us seem very hard oh mrs disney you can't think how difficult a priest's office is sometimes when he has to reconcile the afflicted with the providence that has seen fit to lay some heavy burden on them they cannot understand they cannot say it is well they cannot kiss the rod but as you say god has been good to you your lines have been set in pleasant places you are hedged round and sheltered by love i never saw greater affection in husband for wife than i have seen in your husband i never saw sister more devoted to sister than your sister-in-law is to you she had sunk again into a sitting position on the low bank at the foot of the wall her face was still hidden and her sobs came faster as he spoke to her why should you grieve at the thought of their love is it because it may please god to take you from them in the morning of your life if it is that dread which agitates you i entreat you to put it aside there is nothing in your case that forbids hope and hope will do much to help your recovery you should tell yourself how valuable your life is to those who love you the thought of their affection should give you courage to struggle against apathy and languor believe me invalids have their condition a great deal more in their own power than they are inclined to believe so much can be overcome where the spirit is strong and brave where faith and hope fight against bodily weakness you ought not to be sitting alone here in this saddening spot it is lovely but with the beauty of death you ought to be driving out to frascati or to tivoli with your husband you ought to be watching the carriages in the pincian gardens or amusing yourself in one of the picture galleries i'd rather be alone she said wiping away her tears and in some degree recovering her self-possession that is a morbid fancy and one that hinders your recovery i have no wish to recover i only want to die my dear mrs disney it is your duty to fight against these melancholy moods can you be indifferent to your husband's feelings have you not the mother's natural desire to watch over your child's early years to see him reach manhood no 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 she cried passionately i have had enough of life they are dear to me very dear no wife ever loved and honoured her husband more than i love and honour mine but it is all over it is past and ended i am more than resigned to death i am thankful that god has called me away he watched her closely as she spoke watched her with his hand upon hers which was cold as ice he had heard such words before from the early doomed but they had been accompanied by religious exaltation they had been the outpouring of a faith that saw the gates of heaven opened and the son of man sitting in glory 
of a love that longed to be with God. Here there was no sign of hope or exaltation. There were only the tokens of despair. He remembered how agitated he had seen her many times in the little church at San Remo, and how, although hanging eagerly upon his preaching, she had persistently avoided anything like serious conversation with him upon the few occasions when he had found himself alone with her. He had her testament still in his hand, and looking down at the tear-stained page, it seemed to him that there lay the clue to her melancholy. "'You have been reading the story of the woman of Samaria?' he said. "'Yes.' "'And you have read that other story of her, who knelt in the dust at her Saviour's feet, and to whom he said, "'Neither do I condemn thee.' "'Yes.' Is there anything in either of those stories to sadden you more than the thought of sin and sorrow saddens all of us? She looked at him shrinkingly, pale as death, as if he had a dagger in his hand, ready to strike her. No, I don't suppose there is anything that goes home to my heart any more than to other hearts, she said, after a pause, trying to speak carelessly. We are all sinners. The gospel teaches us that in every line. We are none of us altogether worthy. Not even my husband, I suppose, although to me he seems a perfect Christian. I can believe that he is a Christian, Mrs. Disney, and a man of strong convictions. If he had wronged anybody, I do not think he would rest till he had atoned for that wrong. I am sure he would not. He would do his uttermost to atone. And so would I, although I do not pretend to be half so good a Christian as he is. I would do all in my power to atone for any wrong I had done to one I loved. As you love your husband, for instance? Yes, as I love him. He is first in the world for me. Dear as my child is, Martin must always be first. And you would not for the world do him any wrong? pursued the priest, more and more earnest as he went on, pale with emotion, his whole power of observation concentrated upon the whitening face and lowered eyelids of the woman sitting at his feet. "'Not for the world, not for my life,' she said, with her hands tightly clasped, her eyes still hidden under the heavy lids, tearless now, and with dry and quivering lips, from which the words came with a dull and soulless sound. I would die to save him an hour's pain. I would fling away this wretched life rather than grieve him for a moment. Poor soul, murmured the priest, pitying that debt of self-abasement which he understood so well, under whatsoever guise she might hide her contrition. Poor soul, you talk too lightly of that great mystery, which we should all face in a spirit of deep humility. Do you feel that you can contemplate that passage through death to a new life without fear of the issue? Have you no reckoning to make with the God who pardons repentant sinners? Do you stand before him with a clear conscience, having kept nothing back, cherished no hidden sin? No one can be without sin in his sight. Do you suppose that I am sinless, or that I have ever believed myself sinless? I know how weak and poor a thing I am, a worm in the sight of him who rules the universe. But if, if he cares for such as I, he knows that I am sorry for every sinful thought and every sinful act of my life. She spoke in short sentences, each phrase broken by a sob. She felt as if he were tearing out her heart, this man who had been heretofore so kindly and indulgent in his speech and manner that he seemed to make religion an easy thing, a garment as loose and expansive as philosophy itself. And now, all at once he appeared before her as a judge, searching out her heart, cruel, inflexible, weighing her in the balance and finding her wanting. If I am sorry, 
she murmured between her sobs what more can god or man require of me nothing if your sorrow is that true sorrow which means repentance and goes hand in hand with atonement forgive me my dear friend for presuming to speak unreservedly to you if i try to find out the nature of your wound it is only that i may help you to heal it ever since i have known you i have seen the tokens of a wounded heart a bruised and broken spirit i saw you surrounded with all the blessings that make women's lot happy it was hardly possible to conceive fairer surroundings and truer friends can you wonder then if my compassionate interest was awakened by the indications of a deep-rooted sorrow for which there was no apparent cause i saw your emotion in church saw how quickly your heart and mind responded to the appeal of religion saw in you a soul attuned to heavenly things and day by day my interest in you and yours grew stronger the hope of seeing you again of helping you to bear your burden of ultimately lightening it was one of my reasons for coming to rome i felt somehow that you and i had not met in vain that my power to move you was not without a meaning in both our lives that if as i thought you needed spiritual help and comfort it was my vocation to help and comfort you and so i came to rome and so i found out where you spent your quiet hours and so i have followed you here this afternoon tell me mrs disney did i presume too much was it the preacher's vanity or the priest's intuition that spoke it was intuition she said you saw that i had sinned none but a sinner could shed such tears could so feel the terror of god's wrath it is of his love i want you to think of his immeasurable love and pity of his son's divine compassion if you have any special need of his pardon if there is any sinful secret locked in your heart do not let the golden hours go by the time meet for repentance i have repented she cried piteously my life has been one long repentance ever since my sin and your husband he who so fondly loves you he knows all and has forgiven all knows the word broke from her lips almost in a shriek of horror he knows nothing he must never know he would despise me leave me to die alone while he went far away from me to the very end of the world he would take his son with him i should be left alone alone to face death the most desolate creature god ever looked upon oh father rodwell why have you wrung my secret from me she cried grovelling on her knees in the long grass beside him clinging to his hand as he bent over her gravely compassionate deeply moved by her distress how cruel to question to torture me how cruel to use your power of reading guilty hearts you will tell my husband who so loves and trusts me you will tell him what a guilty wretch i am tell him mrs disney can you forget that i am a priest for whom the sinner's confession is sacred do you think i have never talked with the tempted and the sorrowing before to-day do you think that grief such as yours can be an unknown experience to a man who has worked in a crowded london parish for nearly twenty years i wanted to know the worst so that i might be able to advise and to console you if i have questioned you to-day it has been as a priest has the right to question and this place where you and i have met to-day is in my sight as sacred as the confessional you need have no fear that i shall tell your husband the secret of your sorrow all i will do is to help you to find strength to tell him yourself oh no 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 she cried piteously 
never never i can die i am prepared to die but i can never tell him i cannot i dare not yet you could dare to die with a lie upon your lips you who are ready to meet your judge you whose whole life is a lie you who have cheated and betrayed the best of men oh mrs disney reflect what this thing is which you are doing reflect what kind of sin it is you are committing if as your own sorrowing words acknowledge you have been a false wife a false wife to the best and truest of husbands can you dare to act out that falsehood to the last to die with that guilty secret locked in your heart from him who has a right to know and who alone upon earth has a right to pardon oh how cruel you are she said lifting up her streaming eyes to his earnest inflexible face is it a christian's part to be so cruel to break the bruised reed to crush anything so weak and wretched as i am is not repentance enough i have spent long nights in penitence and tears long days in dull aching remorse i would have given all my future life to atone for one dreadful hour one unpremeditated yielding to temptation i have given my life for my secret has killed me what more can man or god demand of me what more can i do to win forgiveness only this tell your husband the truth however painful however humiliating the confession that will be your best atonement that is the sacrifice which will help to reconcile you with your god you cannot hope for god's love and pardon hereafter if you live and die as a hypocrite here god's saints were some of them steeped in the darkness of guilt before they became the children of light but there was not one of them who shrank from the confession of his sins you are a man sobbed isola you do not know what it is for a woman to confess that she is unworthy of her husband's love you do not know it is not possible for a man to know the meaning of shame you are wrong there he said gently lifting her from the ground and placing her beside him on the bank what chastity is to a woman honour is to a man men have had to stand up before their fellow men and acknowledge their violation of man's code of honour knowing that such acknowledgment made them dirt and very dirt in the sight of honourable men you as a woman know not how deep men's scorn cuts a man who has sinned against the law which governs gentlemen a woman thinks there is no such sting as the sting of her shame men know better yes i know that it will be most bitter more bitter than death for you to tell colonel disney that you are not what you have seemed to him but apart from all considerations of duty do not his love and devotion deserve the sacrifice of self-love on your part can you bear yourself to the last as a virtuous wife enjoying his respect knowing that it is undeserved i will tell him at the last she faltered in that parting hour i shall not shrink from telling him all how i sinned against him almost unawares drifting half unconsciously into a fatal entanglement and then and then against my will in my weakness and helplessness alone in the power of the man i loved betrayed into sin oh god why do you make me remember she cried wildly turning upon the priest in passionate reproachfulness for years i have been trying to forget trying to blank out the past praying 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 that my humble tearful love for my husband and my child might cancel those hours of sin and you come to me and question me and on pretence of saving my soul 
you force me to look back upon that bygone horror to live again through that time of madness the destruction of my life cruel 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 forgive me said father rodwell very gently seeing that she was struggling with hysteria i have been too hard perhaps too eager to convince you of the right there are some men even of my sacred calling who would judge your case otherwise who would say the husband is happy in his ignorance the wife has repented of her sin non quieta movere but it is not in my nature to choose the easy pathways and it may be that i am too severe a teacher we will not talk any more about serious things to-day only believe that i am your friend your sincere and devoted friend if i have spoken hard things be assured i would have spoken in the same spirit had you been my own sister let us say no more yet a while and perhaps when you have thought over our interview to-day you will come to see things almost as i see them i won't press the matter i will leave your own heart and conscience to plead with you and now may i walk home with you before the beauty of the afternoon begins to fade the vetturino will be waiting for me at the gate isola answered with a dull dead voice rising languidly and adjusting the loosened hair about her forehead with tremulous fingers she had thrown off her hat a little while before and now she took it up and straightened the loops of ribbon with a nervous touch here and there and then put the hat on again and arranged the gossamer veil which she hoped might hide her swollen eyelids and tear-stained cheeks if martin should come to meet me what will he think she said piteously let me go with you and i may be able to distract his attention if you don't want him to see that you have been crying no no he must not see he would wonder and question me and guess perhaps as you did just now how was it you knew what made you guess she asked with a sense of rebellion against this man who had pierced the veil behind which she had been hiding herself so long i saw your sorrow and i knew that there could scarcely be so deep a sorrow if there were no memory of sin will you take my arm down this steep path no thank you i know every step i could walk about this place in my sleep you have been cruel to me father rodwell very cruel promise me one thing by way of atonement for your cruelty promise me that if i die in rome i shall be buried in this place and as near shelley's grave as they can find room to lay me i promise yes it is a sweet spot is it not it was down yonder in the old burial ground that shelley looked upon the grave of keats and said it was a spot to make one in love with death but i would not have you think yourself doomed to an early death mrs disney have you never read in the lives of the saints how some who were on the point of death have revived at the touch of the holy oil and have lived and have renewed their strength and re-entered the world to lead a holier and nobler life than they had led before who knows if you were to confess your sin and patiently suffer whatever penance you were called upon to bear new vistas might not open for you there is more than one way of being happy in this world if you could never know again the sweetness of a domestic life as trusted wife and happy mother there are other and wider lives in which you would count your children and your sisters by hundreds there are sisterhoods in which your future might be full of usefulness and full of peace or if you had no vocation for that wider life it might be that touched by your helplessness in the past and your remorse in the present your husband might find it in his heart to forgive that bygone sin and still to cherish and still to hold you dear no no she cried impatiently i would not live for an hour after he knew i know what he would do he has told me he would leave me at once and for ever i should never see his face again i should be dead to him 
by a worse death than the grave for he would only think of me to shudder at my name oh father rodwell christianity must be a cruel creed if it can demand such a sacrifice from me what good can come of his knowing the truth only agony to him and shame and despair to me can that be good truth is life and falsehood is death answered the priest firmly you must choose your own course mrs disney but there is one argument i may urge as a man of the world rather than as a priest nothing is ever hidden for very long in this life there is no secret so closely kept that some one has not an inkling of it better your husband should hear the truth from you in humble self-accusation than that he should learn it later perhaps after he has mourned you from years from a stranger's lips oh that would be horrible too horrible but i will confess to him i will tell him everything on my deathbed yes when life is ebbing when the end is close i will tell him he shall know what a false and perjured creature i am i swore to him swore before god that i was true and faithful that i loved him and no other and it was true absolute truth when i took that oath my sin was a thing of the past i had loved another and i had let my love lead me into sin and then my husband asked me if i had been true and pure always always is that true isola i call upon god to hear your answer he said and i answered yes it was true i lied before god rather than lose my husband's love and god heard me and the blight of his anger has been upon me ever since withering and consuming me they went down the steep pathway father rodwell first isola following between the crowded graves the azaleas and camellias veronica and gilda rose lilac and magnolia and on either hand a wilderness of roses red and white the shadows of the cypresses closed over them in that deep alley and the twilight gloom might seem symbolic of the passage through death to life for beyond the gates and through a gap in the cypress screen the level landscape and the city domes and bell towers were shining in the yellow light of afternoon End of chapter 23「All Along the River」by Mary Elizabeth Braddon Chapter 24 Oh, old thoughts, they cling, they cling Colonel Disney and Allegra were both pleased to welcome Father Rodwell to their home in the great city, pleased to find that his own rooms were close by in the Via Babuino, and that he was likely to be their neighbour for some weeks. His familiarity with all that was worth seeing in the city and its surroundings made him a valuable companion for people whose only knowledge had been gathered laboriously from books father rodwell knew every picture and every statue in the churches and galleries there was not a building in christian or pagan rome which had not its history and its associations for the man who had chosen the city as the holiday ground of his busy life long before he left the university and who had returned again and again year after year to tread the familiar paths and ponder over the old records he had seen many of those monuments of republic and empire emerge from the heaped-up earth of ages had seen hills cut down and valleys laid bare some picturesque spots made less picturesque other places redeemed from ruin he had seen the squalor and the romance of medieval rome vanish before the march of improvement 
and he had seen the triumph of the commonplace and the utilitarian in many a scene where the melancholy beauty of neglect and decay had once been dear to him with such a guide it was delightful to loiter amidst the palace of the caesars or tread the quiet lanes and by-paths of the aventine that historic hill from whose venerable church the bearers of christ's message of peace and love set out for savage britain allegra was delighted to wander about the city with such a companion lingering long before every famous picture finding out altar-pieces and frescoes which no guide-book would have helped her to discover sometimes disputing father rodwell's judgment upon the artistic value of a picture sometimes agreeing with him always bright animated and intelligent isola joined in these explorations as far as her strength would allow she was deeply interested in the churches and in the stories of priest and pope saint and martyr which father rodwell had to tell of every shrine and tomb whose splendour might otherwise have seemed colourless and cold there was a growing enthusiasm in the attention with which she listened to every record of that wonder-working church which created christian rome in all its pomp and dignity of architecture and all its glory of art the splendour of those mighty basilicas filled her with an awful sense of the majesty of that religion which had been founded yonder in darkness and in chains in paul's subterranean prison yonder in tears where paul and peter spoke the solemn words of parting yonder in blood on the dreary road to ostia where the headsman's axe quenched the greatest light that had shone upon earth since the sacrifice of calvary isola went about looking at these things like a creature in a dream these stupendous tabernacles impressed her with an almost insupportable sense of their magnitude and with that awe-stricken sense of power in the christian church there was interwoven the humiliating consciousness of her own unworthiness a consciousness sharpened and intensified by every word that father rodwell had spoken in that agonizing hour of her involuntary confession he was so kind to her so gentle so courteous in every word and act that she wondered sometimes whether he had forgotten that miserable revelation whether he had forgotten that she was one of the lost ones of this earth a woman who had forfeited woman's first claim to man's esteem sometimes she found herself lifting her eyes to his face in an unpremeditated prayer for pity as they stood before some exquisite shrine of the madonna and the ineffable purity in the sculptured face looking down at her struck like a sharp sword into her heart that mute appeal of isola's seemed to ask has the mother of christ any pity for such a sinner as i colonel disney was full of thoughtfulness for his wife in all their going to and fro and before their day's rambles were half done he would drive her to any quiet spot where she might choose to spend a restful hour in the afternoon sunshine in this or that convent garden in some shaded corner on the avertine or among the wild flowers that flourish and grow rank amidst the ruins of palace and temple on the palatine her favourite resort was still the english cemetery and she always begged to be set down within reach of that familiar gate where the custodian knew her as well as if she had been some restless spirit whose body lay under one of those marble urns and whose ghost passed in and out of the gate every day it was in vain that her husband or her sister offered to be her companion in these restful hours she always made the same reply i am better alone she would say it does me good to be alone i don't like being alone indoors i get low-spirited and nervous but i like to sit among the flowers and to watch the lizards darting in and out among the graves i am never dull there i take a book with me 
but i don't read much i could sit there for hours in a summer dream martin disney made a point of giving way to her will in all small things she might be capricious she might have morbid fancies that was no business of his it was his part to indulge her every whim and to make her in love with life all that he asked of heaven was to spin out that attenuated thread all that he desired was to hold her and keep her for his own against death himself the vendetta was at civita vecchia from which port her skipper frequently bore down upon rome distracting allegra from her critical studies in the picture galleries and from her work in her own studio a light airy room on the fourth floor with a window looking over the pincian gardens captain halbert was a little inclined to resent father rodwell's frequent presence in the family circle and his too accomplished guidance in the galleries it was provoking to hear a man talk with an almost ruskinesque enthusiasm and critical appreciation of pictures which made so faint an appeal to the seaman here and there john halbert could see the beauty and merit of a painting and was really touched by the influence of supreme art but of technical qualities he knew nothing and could hardly distinguish one master from another was as likely as not to take titian for veronese or tintoret for titian he looked with a sceptical eye at the anglican priest's cassock and girdle if father rodwell had been a papist it would have been altogether a more satisfactory state of things but an anglican a man who might preach the beauty of holy poverty and a celibate life one year and marry a rich widow the year after a man bound only by his own wishes had allegra been a thought less frank had she been a woman whom it was possible to doubt the sailor would have given himself over to the demon of jealousy but there are happily some women in whom truth and purity are so transparently obvious that even an anxious lover cannot doubt them allegra was such a one no suspicion of coquetry ever lessened her simple womanliness she was a woman of whom a man might make a friend a woman whose feelings and meanings he could by no possibility mistake he had pleaded his hardest and pleaded in vain for a june wedding isola's state of health was too critical for the contemplation of any change in the family circle she could not do without me nor could martin either allegra told her lover it is i who keep house and manage their money and see to everything for them martin has been utterly helpless since this saddening anxiety began he thinks of nothing but isola and her chances of recovery i cannot leave him while she is so ill have you any hope of her ever being better my dear girl i don't know it has been a long and wearing illness it is not illness allegra it is a gradual decay my fear is that she will never revive there is no marked disease nothing for medicine to fight against such cases as hers are the despair of doctors a spring has been broken somehow in the human machine science cannot mend it allegra was very much of her sweetheart's opinion the english doctor in rome was as kind and attentive as the doctor at san remo but although he had not yet pronounced the case hopeless he took a by no means cheerful view of his patient's condition he recommended colonel disney to leave the city before the third week in may and to take his wife to switzerland travelling by easy stages and doing all he could to amuse and interest her if on the other hand it were important for colonel disney to be in england he might take his wife back to cornwall in june but in this case she must return to the south in october lungs and heart were both too weak for the risks of an english winter we will not go back to england decided disney 
my wife is not fond of cornwall italy has been a delight to her and switzerland will be new ground god grant the summer may bring about an improvement the doctor said very little and promised nothing closely as they watched her with anxious loving looks it may be that seeing her every day even their eyes did not mark the gradual decline of vitality the inevitable advance of decay she never complained the cough that marked the disease which had fastened on her lungs since february was not a loud or seemingly distressing cough it was only now and then when she tried to walk uphill or overexerted herself in any way that her malady became painfully obvious in the labouring chest flushed cheek and panting breath but she made light even of these symptoms and assured her husband that rome was curing her her spirits had been less equable since father rodwell's appearance she had alternated between a feverish intensity and a profound dejection her changes of mood had been sudden and apparently causeless and those who watched and cherished her could do nothing to dispel the gloom that often clouded over her if she were questioned she could only say that she was tired she would never admit any reason for her melancholy End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer painter all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter twenty five we'll bind you fast in silken cords captain halbert was not selfish enough to plead for his personal happiness in the midst of a household shadowed by the foreboding of a great sorrow martin disney's face as he looked at his wife in those moments which too plainly marked the progress of decay was in itself enough to put a check upon a lover's impatience how could any man plead for his own pleasure for the roses and sunshine of life in the presence of that deep despair he knows that he is doomed to lose her thought halbert knows it and yet tries to hope i never saw such intense unquestioning love one asks oneself involuntarily about any woman is she worth it and then he thought of allegra truthful and impulsive strong as steel transparent as crystal yes such a woman as that was worth the whole of a man's heart worthy that a man should live or die for her but it seemed to him that to compare isola with allegra was to liken an ash sapling to an oak he resigned himself to his disappointment talked no more of venice and the starlit lagoons the summer nights on the lido and quoted no more of ruskin's rhapsodies but he came meekly day after day to join in the family excursion whatever it might be he had enough and to spare of ecclesiastical architecture and of the old masters during those summer-like mornings and afternoons he heard more than enough of the mad caesars and the bad caesars of wicked empresses and of low-born favourites of despotism throned in the palace and murder waiting at the gate of tyranny drunken with power long abused and treason on the watch for the golden opportunity to change one profligate master for another ready to toss up for the new caesar and to accept the basest slave for master would he but open the imperial treasury wide enough to the praetorian's rapacious hands people gloat over these hoary old walls as if they would like to have lived under caligula said the sailor with a touch of impatience when father rodwell had been expatiating upon a little bit of moulding which decorated an imperial staircase 
it would have been at least a picturesque time to have lived in said allegra existence must have been a series of pictures by alma tedema captain hulbert was startled out of his state of placid submission by the intervention of a most unexpected ally it was one of the hottest days there had been since they came to rome to cross the piazza in front of st peter's was like plunging into a bath of molten gold while to enter the great basilica itself was like going into an ice-house father rodwell was not with them upon this particular morning they were a party of four and a roomy landau had been engaged to take them to the church of st paul beyond the walls and thence to the tomb of Cecilia Metella. Isola and Allegra had made pilgrimages to the spot before to-day. It was a drive they both loved, a glimpse of the pastoral life outside the gates of the city, and a place for ever associated with the poet whose verse was written in their hearts. They dawdled over a light luncheon of macaroni and Roman wine at a café, near the great cold white church and then they drove through the sandy lanes in the heat of the afternoon languid all of them and isola paler and more weary looking than she had been for some time her husband watched her anxiously and wanted to go back to rome lest the drive should be too exhausting for her no no i am not tired she answered impatiently i would much rather go on i want to see that grim old tower again and then she quoted the familiar lines dreamily with a faint pleasure in their music perchance she died in youth it may be bowed with woes far heavier than the ponderous tomb that weighed upon her gentle dust besides she added confusedly i want to have a little private talk with captain halbert while allegra is busy with her everlasting memoranda in that dirty little sketch-book which is stuffed with the pictures of the future may i she looked from her husband to captain hulbert pleadingly the latter was first to answer i am at your service mrs disney ready to be interrogated or lectured or advised whichever you like i am not going to do either of the three i am going to ask you a favour consider that to ask is to be obeyed they alighted in the road by the tomb a few minutes afterwards allegra's notebook was out immediately a true artist's book crammed with every conceivable form of artistic reminiscence go and talk she said waving her hand to isola and hulbert and then she clambered up a bank opposite that tower of other days to get a vantage ground for her sketch she had made a score of sketches on the same spot but there were always new details to jot down new effects and ideas on that vast level which frames the grandeur of rome yonder the long line of the aqueduct here the living beauty of broad-fronted oxen moving with stately paces along the dusty way the incarnation of strength and majesty patience and labour stay here and smoke your cigar martin said isola while captain hulbert and i go for a stroll her husband smiled at her tenderly cheered by her unwonted cheerfulness his days and hours alternated between hope and despair this was a moment of hope my dearest you are full of mystery to-day he said and i am as full of curiosity but i can wait consider me a statue of patience standing by the wayside and take your time she put her hand through hulbert's arm and led him away from the other two sauntering slowly along beside the grassy bank i want to talk about your wedding she said as soon as they were out of hearing when are you and allegra going to be married my dear mrs disney you know that i pledged myself to wait a year from the time of our engagement a year from last christmas you must remember that was to be my probation 
Yes, I remember. But that is all foolishness, idle romance. Allegra knows that you love her. I don't think she could know it any better after another half-year's devotion on your part. I don't think she could know it better after another half-century. I know I could never love her more than I do now. I know I shall never love her less. I believe that you are good and true, said Isola, as true and almost as good as he is, with a backward glance at her husband. If I did not believe that, I should not have thought of saying what I am going to say. I am honoured by your confidence in me. I love Allegra too well to hazard her happiness. I know she loves you, has never cared for any one else. She was heart whole till she saw you. She had no more thought of love or lovers than a child. I want you to marry her soon, Captain Hulbert, very soon, before we leave Rome. Would you not like to be married in Rome? I would like to be married in Kamchatka or Nova Zembla, or the worst of those places whose very names suggest uncomfortableness. There is no dismalest corner of the earth which Allegra could not glorify and make dear. But, as you suggest, Rome is classic, Rome is medieval, Rome is Roman Catholic. It would be a new sensation for a plain man like me to be married in Rome. I suppose it could not be managed in St. Peter's. Oh, Captain Halbert, I want you to be serious. I am serious. Why? This is a matter of life or death to me. But I pleaded so hard for a June wedding, and to no purpose. I talked with the artfulness of the first tempter. I tried to play upon her vanities as an artist. All in vain. Tell her that I have set my heart upon seeing her married said Isola, in a low voice. Why, of course you will see her married, whether she is married in Rome or at Trelasco. That is no argument. But it is, indeed it is. Tell her that, if I am to be at her wedding, it must be soon, very soon. Life is so uncertain at best, and although I feel well and strong sometimes, today, for instance, there are other times when I think the end is nearer than even my doctor suspects, and I know by his face that he does not give me a long lease of life. My dear Mrs. Disney, this is morbid. I am grieved to hear you talk in such a strain. Don't notice that. Don't say anything depressing to Allegra. I want her to go off to her Venetian honeymoon very happily, with not one cloud in her sky. She has been so good and dear to me. It would be hard if I could not rejoice in her happiness. I have rejoiced in it always. I shall take pleasure in it to the end of my life. It is the one unclouded spot. She stopped with a troubled air. Yes, it is a happy fate to have cared for one, and one only, and to be loved again. Will you do what I ask you, Captain Hulbert? Will you hurry on the wedding, for my sake? I would do anything difficult and unwelcome for your sake. How much more will I hasten my own happiness, if I can? But Allegra is a difficult personage, as firm as rock when she has once made up her mind. And she has made up her mind to stay with you till you are quite well and strong again. She need not leave me forever, because she marries. She can come back to me after a long honeymoon. We can all meet in Switzerland in August, if, if I go there with Martin, as he proposes. Well, I will try to bend that stubborn will. And you don't mind having a quiet wedding, if she consents to a much earlier date? Mind? The quieter the better for me. I think a smart wedding is a preventative of matrimony. That sounds like a bull. I will say I think there are many wretched bachelors living in dismal chambers and preyed upon by landladies who might have been happily married but for the fear of a smart wedding. We will have as quiet a wedding as you and Disney can desire.
but I should like Lost Withiel to be present. He is my only near relation, and I don't want to cut him on the happiest day of my life. Why, Mrs. Disney, you are trembling. You have agitated yourself about this business. You have talked too much for your strength. Let me take you back to the carriage. Presently, yes, yes. The heat overcame me for a moment, that's all. Would you mind not waiting for Lord Lost with you? I want the marriage to be at once, directly, as soon as Father Rodwell can get it arranged. And you don't know where a telegram would reach your brother? Indeed, I do not. But by speculating a few messages of inquiry, I could soon find out the whereabouts of the Eurydice. Don't wait for that. There would be delay. There must be delay if you have to consult any distant person's convenience. We are all here, you and Allegra, and Martin and I, and Father Rodwell would like to marry you. What do you want with anybody else? Upon my word, I think you are right. Allegra is a creature of impulse, where principle is not at stake. If I asked her to marry me six weeks hence, she would parley and make terms. If I ask her to marry me in a few days, before we leave Rome, she may consent. Have you talked to your husband? Is he of your opinion? I have said nothing to him, but I know he would be pleased to see you and Allegra bound together for life. I will talk to him this afternoon. One can get everything one wants in Rome, I believe, from a papal dispensation down to an English solicitor. If we can but rattle through some kind of marriage settlement to your husband's satisfaction, we can be married on the earliest day to which my darling will consent. God bless you, Mrs. Disney, for your unselfish thought of other people's happiness. You are not like most invalids, who would let a sister languish in lifelong spinsterhood rather than lose her as a nurse. God grant that your unselfishness may be recompensed by speedy recovery. There will be a weight off my mind when you and Allegra are married, said Isola gravely. They walked slowly back to the spot where they had left their companions. A pair of oxen, with an empty cart, were standing in the road below the tomb, their driver lounging across the rough vehicle, man and beasts, motionless as marble. Allegra sat on a hillock opposite, sketching the group. She had bribed the man to draw up for a brief halt while she made her sketch. The massive heads were drooping under the afternoon sun. The tawny and cream-hued coats were stained with dust and purpled with the sweat of patient labour. The creatures looked as gracious and as wise as if they had been gods in disguise. "'Now, Allegra,' said her brother, emptying the ashes out of his pipe. Are you ready to go home? Yes, I have just jotted down what will serve to remind me of those splendid beasts, but I should like to have them standing there all day, so that I could paint them seriously. They are the finest models I have seen in Rome. Have you two quite finished your secrets and mysteries? she asked, smiling at Isola, who was looking brighter than usual. Yes, I have said all I have to say, and have been answered as I wish to be answered. I shall go home very happy. That's a good hearing, said Disney, as he helped her into the landau. Allegra had talked of wanting to revisit Caracalla's baths, a wish of which Isola reminded her, as they drove back to the city along the Appian Way, whereupon Captain Halbert suggested that he and his sweetheart should stop to explore the ruins, while Disney and Isola went home. Allegra blushed and consented, always a little shy at being alone with her lover, especially since he had pleaded so earnestly for a summer honeymoon. Mrs. Disney, your right place in Rome would be the embassy, murmured Hulbert as he shut the carriage door. You are a born diplomatist. "'What makes my dearest look so pleased and happy this afternoon?' asked Disney, as he changed to the seat beside his wife. "'I am glad, because I think Captain Hulbert 
will persuade allegra to marry him before we leave rome i begged him to hasten their marriage that was my mystery martin that was what he and i were talking about but why wish to hasten matters dear they are very happy as it is and a year is not a long engagement too long for me martin i want to see her happy i want to see them married before before what dear love he asked tenderly before we leave rome that would be very short work we leave in a fortnight the weather will be growing too hot for you if we linger later yes but everything can be settled in less time than that ask father rodwell he knows rome so well that he can help you to arrange all details i thought that every young woman required at least six months for the preparation of her trousseau not such a girl as allegra she is always well dressed and her wardrobe is the perfection of neatness but she is not the kind of girl to make a fuss about her clothes i don't think the trousseau will create any difficulty and when she is gone what will you do without your devoted companion who will nurse you and take care of you lottchen or any other servant she answered with a kind of weary indifference it would be very hard if my bad health should stand in the way of allegra's happiness so long as you will stay with me and be kind to me martin i need no one else tears were streaming down her cheeks as she turned from him pretending to be interested in the convent walls on the edge of the hill below which they were driving so long as i stay with you my darling do you think business or pleasure or any claim in this world will ever take me from you any more all your hours are precious to me isola i hardly live when i am away from you wherever your doctor may send you or your own fancy may lead you i shall go with you unhesitatingly without one regret for anything i leave behind don't say these things she cried suddenly with a choking sob you are too good to me there are times when i can't bear it end of chapter twenty five chapter twenty six of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter All Along the River by Mary Elizabeth Braddon Chapter 26 So full content shall henceforth be my lot. Allegra was not inexorable. There, in the ruins of the imperial baths, where Shelley dreamed the wonder dream of his Prometheus, captain hulbert pleaded his cause could love resist the pleading of so fond a lover could art withstand the allurements of venice titian and tintoret the cathedral of st mark and the palace of the doges the birthplace of desdemona and of shylock the home of byron and of browning she consented to a roman marriage i cannot help wishing i could be a papist just for that one day she said lightly an anglican marriage seems so dry and cold compared with the pomp and splendours of rome dearest the plainest christian rites are enough if they but make us one i think we are that already john she answered shyly and then nestling by his side as they sat in the wide solitude of that stupendous pile she took his hand and held it in both her own looking down at it wonderingly a well-formed hand strong and muscular broadened a little by seafaring and you are to be my husband she said mine i shall speak of you to people as my own peculiar property my husband will do this or that my husband has gone out but he will be home soon home husband how strange it sounds strange and wonderful now love sweet and familiar before our honeymoon is ended 
they went out of the broad spaces that were once populous with the teeming life of imperial rome splendid with all that art could create of beauty and of grandeur wrapped in the glamour of their dream they walked all the way to the piazza di spagna in the same happy dream as unconscious of the ground they trod on as if they had been floating in the air they were a very cheerful party at dinner that evening father rodwell dined with them and was delighted at the idea of having to marry these happy lovers he took the arrangement of the ceremony into his own hands the english chaplain was his old friend and would let him do what he liked in his church it is to be a very quiet wedding said the colonel when the three men were smoking together in a loggia looking on the little garden of orange trees and oleanders in the grey dim beginning of night when the thin crescent moon was shining in a sky still faintly flushed with sunset heiser could not stand anything like bustle or excitement luckily we have no friends in rome there is no one belonging to us who could be aggrieved at not being invited and there is no one except loswithiel on my side who has the slightest claim to be present said hulbert i am almost as well off as the flying dutchman in that respect i am not troubled with relations all the kinsfolk i have are distant and i allow them to remain so my dear disney as far as i am concerned our wedding cannot be too quiet a business it is the bride i want mark you not the fuss and flowers wedding breakfast and bridesmaids let us be married at half past ten and drive from the church to the railway station in time for the noonday train i have given up my dream of taking allegra round southern italy to the adriatic we shall go to florence first and spend a few days in the galleries and thence to venice where we'll have the vendetta brought to us and anchored near the arsenal ready to carry us away directly we are tired of the city of old memories father rodwell left them and went into the drawing-room where isola and her sister-in-law were sitting in the lamplight isola's hands occupied with that soft fluffy knitting which seemed to exercise a soothing influence upon her nerves allegra leaning over the table idly sketching random reminiscences of the baths the tomb the grave-eyed oxen with their great curving horns and ponderous foreheads the priest was interested in watching isola this evening he saw a marked change in the expression of her countenance a change which was perceptible to him even in her voice and manner a brightness which might mean a lightened heart or which might mean religious exaltation as she told him he wondered studying her from his place in the shadow as the lamplight shone full upon her wasted features and hectic colouring has she taken courage and confessed her sin to that loyal loving husband and is the burden lifted from her heart no he could not believe that she had lifted the veil from the sad secret of her past martin disney's unclouded brow to-night was not that of a man who had lately discovered that the wife he loved had betrayed him there might be pardon there might be peace between husband and wife after such a revelation but there could not be the serenity which marked martin disney's manner to his wife to-night such a thunderclap must leave its brand upon the man who suffered it no her secret was still locked in her impenitent heart sorry yes she had drunk the cup of remorse in all its bitterness but she knew not true penitence the christian's penitence which means self-abasement and confession and yet she seemed happier there was a look of almost holy resignation upon the pale and placid brow and in the two lustrous eyes something had happened some moral transformation which made her a new being father rodwell drew his chair nearer to her and looked at her earnestly with his cordial almost boyish smile he was a remarkably young-looking man 
a man upon whom long years of toil in the dark places of the earth had exercised no wasting or withering influence he had loved his work too well ever to feel the pressure of the burdens he carried his gospel had been always a cheerful gospel and he had helped to lighten sorrows never to make them heavier he was deeply interested in isola and had been watchful of all her changes of mood since their conversation in the shadow of the old roman wall he had seen her impressed by the history and traditions of the church moved by the pathos of holy lives touched almost to tears by sacred pictures and he saw in her character and disposition a natural bent towards piety exactly that receptive temperament which moves holy women to lives of self-abnegation and heroic endeavour he had lent her some of those books which he loved best and read most himself and he had talked with her of religion careful not to say too much or with too strong an emphasis and never by any word alluding to her revelation of past guilt he wanted to win her to perfect trustfulness in him to teach her to lean upon him in her helplessness until the hour should come when she would let him lead her to her husband in the self-abasement of the penitent sinner he knew that in this desire he exceeded the teaching of churchmen that another priest in his place might have bade her keep her sad secret to the end lie down with it in her early grave be remembered as a saint yet die knowing herself a sinner if he had thought of the husband's peace first he would have counselled silence but he thought most of this stricken soul with wings that spread themselves towards heaven held down to earth by the burden of an unpardoned sin he looked at her in the lamplight and her eyes met his with a straighter outlook than he had seen in them for a long time she looked actually happy and that look of happiness in a face on which death has set its seal has always something which suggests a life beyond the grave the excitement of this marriage question has brightened you wonderfully mrs disney he said we shall have you in high health by the wedding day i am feeling better because i am so glad isola answered naively putting her hand into allegra's i consider it positively insulting to me as a sister exclaimed allegra bending down to kiss the too transparent hand such a hand as she had seen in many a picture of dying saint in the roman galleries you are most unaffectionately rejoiced to get rid of me i have evidently been a tyrannical nurse and a dull companion and you breathe more freely at the prospect of release you have been all that is dear and good isola answered softly and i shall feel dreadfully lonely without you but it won't be for long and i shall be so comforted by the knowledge that nothing can come between you and your life's happiness the two men came in from the loggia bringing with them the cool breath of night isola went to the piano and played one of those adagios of mozart's which came just within the limit of her modest powers and which she played to perfection all her soul in the long lingering phrases the tender modulations with their suggestions of shadowy cathedral aisles and the smoke of incense in the deepening dusk of a vesper service those bits of mozart the slow movements from the sonatas an agnus dei or an ave maria from one of the masses satisfied captain hulbert's highest ideas of music he desired nothing grander or more scientific the new learning of the wagnerian school had no charm for him if you ask me about modern composers i am for verdi and guno he said for gaiety and charm give me aubert rossini and boldieu for pathos weber for everything mozart there you have the whole of my musical education 
the question of settlements was opened seriously between martin disney and his future brother-in-law early on the following morning halbert wanted to settle all the money he had in the world upon allegra she is ever so much wiser than i am he said so she had better be my treasurer my property is all in stocks and shares my grandfather was fond of stock jobbing and made some very lucky investments which he settled upon my mother with strict injunctions that they should not be meddled with by her trustees my share of her fortune comes to a little over nine hundred a year i came into possession of it when i came of age and it is mine to dispose of as i like trusts expired trustees cleared off in point of fact both gone over to the majority poor old souls after having had many an anxious hour about those south american railway bonds and suez canal shares which turned up trumps after all i've telegraphed to the family lawyer for a schedule of the property and when that comes just tie it all up in as tight a knot as the law can tie and let it belong to allegra and her children after her consider me paid off martin disney laughed at the lover's impetuosity and told him that he should be allowed to bring so much and no more into settlement allegra's income was less than two hundred a year a poor little income upon which she had fancied herself rich so modest is woman's measure of independence as compared with man's it would be for the lawyer to decide what proportion the husband's settlements should bear to the wife's income father rodwell had given colonel disney an introduction to a solicitor of high character a man who had occupied an excellent position in london until damaged lungs obliged him to seek a home in the south with this gentleman's aid matters were soon put in train and while the men were in the lawyer's office the two women were choosing allegra's wedding gown the young lady had exhibited a rare indifference upon the great trousseau question she was not one of those girls whose finery is all external and who hide rags and tatters under aesthetic colouring and raphael draperies she was too much of an artist to endure anything unseemly in her belongings and her everyday clothes just as they were might have been exhibited like a royal trousseau without causing any other comment than how nice what good taste what exquisite needlework the hands which painted such clever pictures were as skilful with the needle as with the brush and allegra had never considered that a vocation for art meant uselessness in every feminine industry she had attended to her own wardrobe from the time she learnt plain sewing at her first school and now as she and isola looked over the ample array of underlinen the pretty cambric peignoirs and neatly trimmed petticoats they were both of one mind that there was very little need of fuss or expenditure i have plenty of summer frocks said allegra so really there is only my travelling gown to see about that is to say the gown i am to be married in but you must have a real wedding gown all the same a white satin gown with lace and pearls pleaded isola when you go to dinner parties by and by you will be expected to look like a bride dinner parties oh those are a long way off we are not likely to be asked to any parties while we are wandering about italy i can get a gown when i go home allegra's wedding day had dawned a glorious day a day to make one drunken with the beauty of sky and earth a day when the vetturini in the piazza di spagna sat and dreamt on their coach boxes narcotized by the sun when the reds and blues in the garments of the flower women were almost too dazzling for the eye to look upon and when every garden in the city sent forth tropical odours of roses steeped in sunlight the church in which the lovers were to be made one was a very homely temple as compared with the basilicas yonder on the hills of rome but what did that matter to allegra this morning as she stood before the altar and spoke the words 
which gave her to the man she loved a flood of sunshine streamed upon the two figures of bride and bridegroom and touched the almost spectral face of the bride's sister-in-law a face which attracted as much attention as the bride's fresh bloom and happy smile it was a face marked for death yet beautiful in decay the large violet eyes were luminous with the light of worlds beyond the world we know there was something loftier than happiness in that vivid look something akin to exaltation the smile of the martyr at the stake the martyr for whom heaven's miraculous intervention changes the flames of the death pile into the soft fanning of seraphic wings the martyr unconscious of earthly pains and earthly cruelties who sees the skies opening and the glorious company of saints and angels gathered about the great white throne father rodwell saw that spiritual expression in the pale wasted face and he told himself that a lost soul could not look out of eyes like those if death were near as he feared the true repentance for which he had prayed many an earnest prayer was not far off bride and groom were to leave rome by the midday train colonel disney was going to see the last of them at the station but isola and her sister-in-law were to say good-bye in the vestry and to part at the church door and now father rodwell's brief but fervent address had been spoken the wedding march pealed from the organ and the small wedding party went into the vestry to sign the registers isola was called upon for her signature as one of the witnesses she signed in a bold clear hand without one tremulous line her husband looking over her shoulder as she wrote that doesn't look like an invalid's autograph does it halbert he asked snatching at every token of hope unwilling to believe what his doctors and his own convictions told him expecting a miracle they had warned him that he could not keep her long they had advised him to humour her fancies to let her be present at the wedding even at the hazard of her suffering afterwards for that exertion and excitement she would suffer more perhaps physically as well as mentally if she were thwarted in her natural wish to be by allegra's side on that day all was finished neither church nor law could do anything more towards making the lovers man and wife the law might undo the bond for them in the time to come but the part of the church was done for ever in the eye of the church their union was indissoluble isola clung with her arms round the bride's neck think of me sometimes dearest in the years to come think that i loved you fondly be sure that i was grateful for all your goodness to me she said tearfully my own love i shall think of you every day till we meet again and if we never meet again on earth will you remember me kindly isa how can you cried allegra silencing the pale lips with kisses you may be glad to think how much you did towards making my life happy happier than it ought to have been isola went on in a low voice dearest i am more glad of your marriage than words can say and allegra love him with all your heart and never let your lives be parted remember dearest never never let anything upon this earth part you from him her voice was choked with sobs and then came a worse fit of coughing than she had suffered for some time a fit which left her exhausted and speechless her husband looked at her in an agony of apprehension let me take you home isa he said you'll be better at home lying down by your sunny window this vestry is horribly cold halbert if you and allegra will excuse me i won't see you off at the station father rodwell will go with you perhaps he'll be of more use than i could be and we shall see each other very soon again in switzerland please god yes yes there is no need for you to go 
Halbert answered, grasping his hand, distressed for another man's pain in the midst of his own happiness. Their death and the end of all joy, here the new life with its promises of gladness just opening before him. Such contrasts must needs seem hard. They all went to the church door where the carriages were waiting. Only a few idlers loitered about the pavement, faintly interested in so shabby a wedding, a poor array of one landau and one broom, the broom to take the travellers to the station, where their luggage had been sent by another conveyance. The two women kissed each other once more before Allegra stepped into the carriage. Isola, too weak for speech, and able only to clasp the hands that had waited on her, in so many a weary hour, the clever hands, the gentle hands, to which womanly instinct and womanly love had given all the skilfulness of a trained nurse. Disney lifted his wife into the landau, Father Rodwell helping him, full of sympathy. "'You'll dine with us to-night, I hope,' said the Colonel. "'We shall be very low if we are left to ourselves.' I have an engagement for this evening, but, yes, I'll get myself excused and spend the evening with you, if you really want me. Indeed we do, answered Disney heartily, but Isola was dumb. Her eyes were fixed upon the distant point at which the broom had disappeared round a corner on its way to the station. End of chapter 26 Chapter Twenty Seven of All Along the River. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. All Along the River by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter Twenty Seven Gone Deeper Than All Plummets Sound. Church bells are always ringing in that city of many churches, and there were bells ringing solemnly and slowly as Isola walked feebly up the two flights of stairs that led to Colonel Disney's lodging. She walked even more slowly than usual, and her husband could hear her labouring breath as she went up, step by step, leaning on the banister rail. He had offered her his arm, but she had repulsed him, almost rudely, at the bottom of the stairs. They went into the drawing-room, which was bright with flowers in a sunlit dusk, the sun streaming in through the narrow opening between the Venetian shutters, which had been drawn together, but not fastened. All was very still in the quiet house, so still that they could hear the splash of the fountain in the piazza, and the faint rustling of the limes in the garden. Husband and wife stood facing each other, he anxious and alarmed, she deadly pale, and with gleaming eyes. Well, she is gone, she is Mrs. Hulbert now, and she belongs to him, and not to us any more, said Disney, talking at random, watching his wife's face in nervous apprehension of, he knew not what. We shall miss her sadly. "'Aren't you sorry she has married Isola, after all?' "'Sorry? No! I am glad, glad with all my heart. I have waited for that.' And then, before he was aware, she had flung herself at his feet, and was kneeling there, with her head hanging down, her hands clasped, a very Magdalen. "'I waited.' till they were married, so that you should not refuse to let her marry. His brother waited to tell you what I ought to have told you at once when you came home from India. My only hope of pardon or of peace was to have told you then, to have left you for ever then, never to have dared to clasp your hand, never to have dared to call myself your wife, never to have become the mother of your child. All my life since that day has been one long lie, 
and nothing that i have suffered not all my agonies of remorse can atone for that lie unless god and you will accept my confession and my atonement to-day it's zola for god's sake stop again the racking cough seized her and she sank speechless at his feet he lifted her in his arms and carried her to the sofa and flung open the shutters and let the light and air stream in upon her as she lay prostrate and exhausted wiping her white lips with a blood-stained handkerchief he looked at her in a kind of horrified compassion he thought that she was raving that the excitement of the morning had culminated in fever and delirium he was going to ring for help meaning to send instantly for her doctor when she stopped him laying her thin cold hand upon his arm and holding him by her side sit down by me martin don't stop me i must tell you all the truth her words came slowly in gasps then with a great effort she gathered up the poor remnant of her strength and went on in a low tremulous voice yet with the tone of one whose resolve was strong as death itself there was a time when i thought i could never tell you that i must go down to my grave with my sin unrevealed and that you would never know how worthless a woman you had loved and cherished then on my knees before my god i vowed that i would tell you all at the last when i was dying and death is not far off now martin i have delayed too long too long there is scarcely any atonement in my confession now i have cheated you out of your love he looked at her horror-stricken their two faces close to each other as he bent over her pillow no this was no delirium there was a terrible reality in her words the eyes looking up at him were not bright with fever but with the steady resolute soul within the soul panting for freedom from sin you have cheated me out of my love he repeated slowly does that mean that you lied to me that night in london that you perjured yourself calling god to witness that you were pure and true i was true to you then martin my sin had been repented of i was your loving loyal wife without one thought but of you loving loyal he cried with passionate scorn you have deceived and dishonoured me you have made your name a byword a jest for such a man as van sittart crowther and for how many more you had lied and lied and lied to me by every look by every word that made you seem a virtuous woman and a faithful wife my god what misery martin have pity pity yes i pity the woman in the streets am i to pity you as i pity them you whom i worshipped whom i thought as pure as the angels wearing nothing of earth but your frail loveliness which to me always seemed more of spirit than of clay and you were false all the time false as hell the toy of the first idle profligate whom chance flung into your path it was lost with you that man was right he would hardly have dared to talk to you as he did if he had not been certain of his facts lost with you was your lover martin have pity she repeated with her hands clasped before her face pity don't i tell you that i pity you pity you whom i used to revere great god can you guess what pain it is to change respect for the creature one loves into pity i told you that i would never hurt you that i would never bring shame upon you isola you have no unkindness to fear from me but you have broken my heart you have slain my faith in man and woman 
I could have staked my life on your purity. I could have killed the man who slandered you. And you swore a false oath. You called upon heaven to witness a lie. I was a miserable creature, Martin. I could not bear to lose your love. If death had been my only penalty, I could have borne it, but not the loss of your love. And your sister and her husband? They were as ready with their lies as you were? He exclaimed bitterly. Don't blame Gwendolen. I telegraphed to her, imploring her to stand by me, to say that I was in London with her. And you are not in London? No, except to pass through when, when I had escaped from him and was on my way home. Escaped? My God! What villainy must have been used against you? So young, so helpless, tell me all without reserve, as freely as you want to be forgiven. I was not utterly wicked, Martin. I did not sin deliberately. I did not know what I was doing when I wrecked my life and destroyed my peace of mind for ever. I never meant to forget you, or to be false to you, but I was so lonely so lonely the days were so dreary and so long even the short autumn days seemed long and the evenings were so melancholy without you and he came into my life suddenly like a prince in a fairy tale and at first i thought very little about him he was nothing more to me than any one else in trelasco and then somehow we were always meeting by accident in the lanes, or by the sea, and he seemed to care for all the things I cared for. The books I loved were his favourites. For a long time we talked of nothing but his travels, and of my favourite books. There was not a word spoken between us that you or any one else could blame. A common opening, said Martin Disney, with scathing contempt. One of the seducer's favourite leads. And then, one evening in the twilight, he told me that he loved me. I was very angry, and I let him see that I was angry, and I did all I could to avoid him after that evening. I refused to go to the ball at Lostwithiel, knowing that I must meet him there. But they all persuaded me. Mrs. Crowther, Mrs. Bainham, Tabitha, they were all bent upon making me go and i went oh god if i had but stood firm against their foolish persuasion if i had but been true to myself but my own heart fought against me i wanted to see him again if only for the last time he had talked about starting for a long cruise to the mediterranean his yacht was ready to sail at an hour's notice you went and you are lost yes lost irretrievably lost it is all one long wild dream when i look back upon it he implored me to go away with him but i told him no 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 not for worlds nothing should ever make me false to my husband nothing i swore it swore an oath which i had not the strength to keep oh it was cruel heartless treacherous the thing he did after that when i was going away from the dance he was there at my side and he put me into the wrong carriage his own carriage and when i had been driven a little way from the hotel the carriage stopped and he got in i thought that he was driving me home i asked him how he could be so cruel as to be with me in his own carriage at the risk of my reputation but he stopped me, shut my lips with his fatal kiss. Oh, Martin, how can I tell these things? The horse went almost at a gallop. I thought we should be killed. I was half fainting when the carriage stopped at last, after rattling up and down hill, and he lifted me out, and I felt the cold night air on my face, the salt spray from the sea. I tried to ask him where I was, whether this was home, 
but the words died on my lips and i knew no more knew no more till i woke from that dead dull swoon in the cabin of the vendetta and heard the sailors calling out to each other and saw lost with eel sitting by my side and then and then it was all one long dream a dream of days and nights and rain and tempest i thought the boat was going down in that dreadful night in the bay of biscay would to god that she had gone down and hidden me and my sin for ever but she lived through the storm and in the morning she was anchored near arcachon and lostwithiel went on shore and sent a woman in a boat to bring me clothes and to attend upon me and i contrived to go on shore with the woman when she went back in the boat that had brought her and i borrowed some money on my ring at a jeweller's in arcachon and i left by the first train for paris and went on from paris to london and never stopped to rest anywhere till i got home may god bring me face to face with that ruffian who imposed upon your helplessness cried martin disney no no martin he was not a ruffian he betrayed me but i loved him he knew that i loved him i was as great a sinner as he i was his before he stole me from my home his in mind and in spirit it was our unhappy fate to love each other and i forgave him martin i forgave him on that night of tempest when i thought we were going to die together you don't expect me to forgive him do you you don't expect me to forgive the seducer who has ruined your life and mine his brother is your sister's husband martin i am sorry for it oh john hulbert is good he is frank and true he is not like the other but oh martin pity lost with ill and his sin as you pity me and my sin it is past and done i was mad when i cared for him a creature under a spell you won my heart back to you by your goodness you made me more than ever your own all that he had ever been to me all that i had ever thought or felt about him was blotted out as if i had never seen his face nothing remained but my love for you and my guilty conscience the aching misery of knowing that i was unworthy of you he took her hand and pressed it gently in silence then after a long pause when she had dried the tears from her streaming eyes and was lying faint and white and still caring very little what became of her poor remnant of life he said softly i forgive you isola as i pray god to forgive you i have spent some happy years with you not knowing if it was a delusion it was very sweet while it lasted it was not a delusion she cried putting her arms round his neck in a sudden rapture at being pardoned my love was real the door opened softly and the kindly face of the anglican priest looked in i have seen the lovers on their way to florence he said and have come to ask how mrs disney is after her fatiguing morning i am happier than i have been for a long time answered isola holding out her hand to him i am prepared for the end let it come when it may he knew what she meant and that the sinner had confessed her sin come out for a stroll with me disney he said and leave your wife to rest for a little while i am afraid she'll miss her kind nurse disney started up confusedly like a sleeper awakened and looked at his watch i believe i have a substitute ready to replace allegra by this time he said ringing the bell has the person from england arrived he asked the servant yes sir she came a quarter of an hour ago ask her to come here at once oh martin you have not sent for a hospital nurse i hope cried isola excitedly indeed i am not so bad as that i want very little help i could not bear to have a stranger about me this is not a stranger isola 
there came a modest knock at the door as he spoke come in he said and a familiar figure in a grey merino gown and smart white cap with pink ribbons entered quietly and came to the sofa where isola was lying tabitha she cried don't say you're sorry to see an old face again mrs disney i told mr martin that if you should ever be ill and want nursing i'd come to nurse you if you were at the other end of the world and mr martin wrote and told me you wanted an old servant's care and experience to get you over your illness and here i am i've come every inch of the way without stopping except at the buffets and all i can say is rome is a long way from everywhere and the country i've come through isn't to be compared with cornwall she ran on breathlessly as she seated herself by that reclining figure with the waxen face it may be that she talked to hide the shock she had experienced on seeing the altered looks of the young mistress whose roof she had left in the hour of shame she had left her refusing to hold commune with one who had sinned so deeply the faithful servant had taken leave of her mistress in words that had eaten into isola's heart as if they had been written there with a corrosive acid i am very sorry for you mrs disney she said you are young and pretty and you are very much to be pitied and god knows i have loved you as if you were my own flesh and blood but i won't stay under the roof of a wife who has brought shame upon herself and has dishonoured the best of husbands isola had denied nothing had acknowledged nothing and had let tabitha go and now they met again for the first time after that miserable parting and the servant's eyes were full of pitying tears and the servant's lips spoke only gentlest words what a virtue there must be in death when so much is forgiven to the dying martin disney went out with the priest but at the corner of the piazza he stopped abruptly isola's coughing fit has upset me more than it has her he said i am not fit company for any one so i think i'll go for a tramp somewhere and meet you later at dinner when i've recovered my spirits a little arrivederci said the priest grasping his hand i felicitate you upon this day's union a happy one or i am no judge of men and women i don't know disney answered gloomily the woman is true as steel the man comes of a bad stock you know what the scripture says about the tree and the fruit there never was a race yet that was altogether bad said the priest virtues may descend from remote ancestors as well as vices i think you told me moreover that captain hulbert's mother was a good woman she was she was one of my mother's earliest and dearest friends then you should have a better opinion of her son if ever i met a thoroughly good fellow in my life i believe i met one the day i made captain hulbert's acquaintance pray god you may be right said disney with a sigh i am no judge of character he turned abruptly and skirted the hill on his way to the gardens of the villa borghese where he found shade and seclusion in the early afternoon the carriages of fashionable rome had not yet begun to drive in at the gate the cypress avenues the groves of immemorial ilex the verdant lawns where the fountains leapt sunward were peopled only by creatures of fable fixed in marble fawn and dryad hero and god martin disney plunged into the shadow of one of those funereal avenues and while the sun blazed in almost tropical splendour upon the open lawn in the far distance he walked as it were in the deep of night a night whose gloom harmonized with that darker night in his despairing heart great god how he had loved her how he had looked up to her revering even her weakness as the expression of a childlike purity and while he had been praying for her and dreaming of her and longing for her and thinking of her as the very type of womanly chastity unapproachable by temptation unassailable secure in her innocence 
and simplicity as athene or artemis with all their armour of defence while he had so loved and trusted her she had flung herself into the arms of a profligate as easily won as the lightest wanton she had done this thing and then she had welcomed him with wan sweet smiles to his dishonoured home she had made him drink the cup of shame a byword it might be for the whole parish as well as for that one man who had dared to hint at evil and yet he had forgiven her forgiven one to whom pardon meant only a peaceful ending forgiven as a man holds himself forgiven by an all-merciful god as he hears words of pity and promise murmured into his ear by the priest upon the scaffold when the rope is round his neck and the drop is ready to fall how could he withhold such pardon when he had been taught that god forgives the repentant murderer End of chapter 27chapter 28 of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer painter all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter 28 though love and life and death should come and go isola was alone in the spacious roman drawing-room its wide windows open to the soft warm air the sun was off that side of the house now and the venetian shutters had been pushed back and between the heavy stone pillars of the loggia she saw the orange and magnolia trees in the garden and the pale gold of the mimosa beyond the sun was shining full upon the hill of gardens that hill at whose foot nero was buried in secret at dead of night by his faithful freedman and the devoted woman who loved him to the shameful end of the shameful life that hill whose antique groves the wicked caesar's ghost had once made a place of terror the wicked ghost was laid now modern civilization had sent nero the way of all phantoms and fashionable rome made holiday on the hill of gardens a military band was playing there this afternoon in the golden light and the familiar melodies in don giovanni were wafted ever and anon in little gusts of sweetness to the loggia where the violet crimson of waxen camellias and the softer rose of oleander blossoms gave brightness and colour to the dark foliage and the cold white stone isola heard those far-off melodies faint in the distance heard without heeding the notes were beyond measure familiar interwoven with the very fabric of her life for those were the airs martin disney loved and she had played them to him nearly every evening in their quiet monotonous life she heard unheeding for her thoughts had wandered back to the night of the ball at lost with you and all that went after it the fatal night that struck the death knell of peace and innocence how vividly she remembered every detail her fluttering apprehensions during the long drive on the dark road uphill and downhill her eagerness for the delight of the dance as an unaccustomed pleasure a scene to which young beauty flies as the moth to the flame her remorseful consciousness that she had done wrong in yielding to the temptation which drew her there the longing to see lost with Il once more lost with Il, whom she had vowed to herself never to meet again of her own free will she had gone home that afternoon resolved to forego the ball to make any social sacrifice rather than look upon that man whose burning words of love breathed in her ear before she had enough of nerve or calmness to silence him had left her scathed and seared as if the lightning had blasted her she had heard his avowal there was no room now to doubt the meaning of all that had gone before no ground now for believing in a tender platonic admiration lapping her round with its soft radiance a light but not a fire 
that which had burnt into her soul to-day was the fierce flame of a dishonouring love the bold avowal of a lover who wanted to steal her from her husband and make her a sinner before her god she knew this much had brooded upon it all the evening and yet she was going to a place where she must inevitably meet the tempter she was going because it was expedient to go because her persistent refusal to be there might give rise to guesses and suspicions that would lead to a discovery of the real reason of her absence she had often seen the subtle process the society searchlight by which trelasco and foy could arrive at the innermost working of a neighbour's heart the deepest mysteries of motive she was going to the ball after all fevered anxious full of dim forebodings and yet with an eager expectancy and yet with a strange overmastering joy how should she meet him how could she avoid him without ostentatious avoidance knowing how many eyes would be quick to mark any deviation from conventional behaviour somehow or other she was resolved to avoid all association with him to get her programme filled before he could ask her to dance or to refuse in any case if he asked her he would scarcely venture to approach her after what had been said in the lane when her indignation had been plainly expressed with angry tears no he would hardly dare and so in a vague bewilderment at finding she was at her journey's end she saw the lights of the little town close upon her and in the next few minutes her carriage was moving slowly in the rank of carriages setting down their freight at the door of the inn vaguely as in a dream she saw the lights and the flowers the satin gowns and the diamonds the scarlet and white upon the walls brush and vizard vizard and brush he was not there she looked along the crowd and that tall figure and that dark head were absent she ought to have been glad at this respite and yet her heart grew heavy as lead later he was there and she was waltzing with him at the last moment when he was standing before her cool self-possessed as it were unconscious of that burning past she had no more power to refuse to be his partner than the bird has to escape from the snake she had given him her hand and they were moving slowly softly to the music of the soft slow waltz myosotis myosotis mystic flower which means everlasting remembrance would she ever forget this night their last meeting safest possible meeting place here in the shine of the lamps in the sight of the multitude here she could so easily hold him at a distance here she might speak to him lightly as if she too were unconscious of the past here she was safe against his madness and her own weak unstable heart which fluttered at his smallest word and so the night wore on and she danced with him more times than she could count forgetting or pretending to forget other engagements going through an occasional waltz with another partner just for propriety's sake and hardly knowing who that partner was knowing so well that there was some one else standing against the wall watching her every movement with the love light in his eyes then came the period after supper when they sat in the ante-room and let the dances go by hearing the music of waltzes which they were to have danced together hearing and heeding not and then came a sudden scare at the thought of the hour was it late late very late the discovery fluttered and unnerved her and she was scarcely able to collect her thoughts as he handed her into the carriage and shut the door surely it was a grey horse that brought me she exclaimed and in the next minute she recognised lostwithiel's broom 
the same carriage in which she had been driven home through the rain upon that unforgotten night when his house sheltered her when she saw his face for the first time yes it was his carriage she knew the colour of the lining the little brass clock the reading lamp the black panther rug she pulled at the check string but without effect the carriage drove on slowly but steadily to the end of the town she let down the window and called to the coachman there was only one man on the box and he took no notice of her call yes he had heard perhaps for he drew up his horse suddenly by the roadside a little way beyond the town a man opened the door and sprang in breathless after running it was lost with ill you put me into your carriage she cried distractedly how could you make such a mistake pray tell him to go back to the inn directly they were driving along the country road at a rapid pace and he had seated himself by her side clasping her hand he pulled up the window nearest her and prevented her calling to the coachman why should you go back you will be home sooner with my horse than with the screw that brought you but the fly will be waiting for me the man will wonder let him wonder he won't wait very long you may be assured he will guess what has happened in the confusion of carriages you took the wrong one isola i am going to leave cornwall to-night to leave england perhaps never to return give me the last few moments of my life here be merciful to me i am going away perhaps for ever take me home she said are you really taking me home is this the right way of course it is the right way do you suppose i am going to drive you to london he let down the glass suddenly and pointed into the night isola do you see where we are there's the signpost at the crossroads there's the tower of towered wreath church though you can hardly see it in this dim light are you satisfied now he had drawn up the glass again the windows were clouded by the mist of their mingled breath the atmosphere was faint with the odour of the faded chrysanthemums on her gown and the carnation in the lapel of his coat all that she could see of the outer world was the blurred light of the carriage lamps the high-spirited horse was going up and down the hills at a perilous pace at this rate the journey could not take long and then and then he came back to the prayer he had breathed in her ear more than twelve hours ago in the wintry lane he loved her he loved her he loved her could she refuse to go away with him having woven herself into his life having made him madly helplessly in love with her could she refuse had any woman the right to refuse he appealed to her sense of honour she had gone too far she had granted too much already granting him her love she was in his arms in the dim light in the faint dreamlike atmosphere he was taking possession of her weak heart by all that science of love in which he was past master honour conscience fidelity to the absent piety innocence were being swept away in that lava flood of passion helpless irresolute she faltered again and again take me home lost with you have mercy take me home he stopped those tremulous lips with a kiss the kiss that betrays the carriage dashed down a steep hill rattled along a street so narrow that the wheels seemed to grind against the house fronts on each side downhill again and then the horse was pulled up suddenly in a stony square and the door opened and the soft fresh sea breeze blew among her loosened hair and upon her uncovered neck and she heard the gentle plish plash of a boat moored against the quay at her feet this is not home she cried piteously yes it is home love our home for a little while 
the home that can carry us to the other end of the world if you will the key and the water and the few faint lights here and there grew dark and she knew no more till she heard the sailors crying yo heave yo and the heavy sails flapping and the creak of the boom as it swayed in the wind and felt the dancing motion of the boat as she cut her way through the waves felt the strong arm that clasped her and heard the low fond voice that murmured in her ear isola isola forgive me i could not live without you that which came afterwards had seemed one long and lurid dream a dream of fair weather and foul of peril and despair of passionate all-conquering love to-day as she lay supine in the afternoon silence lying as tabitha had left her in a fevered sleep the vision of that past came back upon her in all its vivid colouring almost as distinctly as it had reacted itself in her hours of delirium when she had lived that tragic chapter of her life over again and had felt the fury of the waves and breathed the chill salt air of the tempest-driven sea and had seen the moon riding high amidst the cloud chaos now appearing now vanishing as if she too were a storm-driven bark in a raging sea oh god how vividly those hours came back the awful progress from ushant to arcachon the darkness of the brief day the horror of the long night the shuddering yacht with straining spars and broadside beaten by a heaving mass of water that struck her with the force of a thousand battering rams blow after blow each blow seeming as if the next must always be the last the final crash an end of all things the pretty dainty vessel long and narrow rode like an eggshell on those furious waters here a long wall of inky blackness rising like a mountain ridge and bearing down on the doomed ship and beyond as far as the eye could reach a waste of surf livid in the moonlight what helpless insignificance as of a leaf tossed on a whirlpool when that mountainous mass took the yacht and lifted her on cyclopean shoulders and shook her off again into the black trough of the sea as into the depths of hell and this not once only nor a hundred times only but on through that endless seeming night on in the sickly winter dawn and in the faint yellow gleam of a rainy noontide on through day that seemed mixed and entangled with night as if the beginning of creation had come round again and the light were not yet divided from the darkness oh those passionate never-to-be-forgotten moments when she had stood with him at the top of the companion looking out upon those livid waters fondly believing that each moment was to be their last that the gates of death were opening yonder a watery way a gulf to which they must go down in a moment in a little moment in a flash in a breath at the next or the next or the next mad plunge of that hurrying bark yes death was there in front of them inevitable imminent immediate and life and sin shame remorse were done with along with the years that lay behind them a page blotted and blurred with one passionate madness which had changed the colour of a woman's life she knew not how she bore up against the force of that tempest clinging to him with her bare wet arms held up by him crouching against the woodwork which shook and rattled with every blow of the battering rams she only knew that his arms were round her that she was safe with him even when the leaping surf rose high above her head wrapping her round like a mantle blinding drowning her in a momentary extinction she only knew that his lips were close to her ear and that in a momentary lull of those awful voices he murmured we are going to die isola the boat cannot live through such a storm we shall go down to death together 
and her lips turned to him with a joyful cry thank god then again in a minute's interval he pleaded forgive me love my stolen love forgive me before we die and again was it a crime isola if it was i forgive you she whispered clinging to him as the blast struck them cruel revulsion of feeling bitter irony of fate when the great grim waves which had seemed like living monsters hurrying down upon them with malignant fury to tear and to devour when the awful sea began to roar with a lesser voice and the thunder of the battering rams had a duller sound and the bows of the yacht no longer plunged straight down into the leaden-coloured pit no longer climbed those inky ridges with such blind impetus as of a cockle-shell in a whirlpool bitter sense of loss and dismay when the grey cold dawn lighted a quieter sea and she heard the captain telling lostwithiel that they had seen the worst of the storm and that there was no fear now he was going to put on more canvas and hadn't the lady better go below where it was warm she needn't feel any way nervous now they would soon be in the roadstead off arcachon she had not felt the chill change from night to morning she had not felt the surf that drenched her loose entangled hair she hardly knew when or how lost with ill had wrapped her in his fur-lined coat but she found that she was so enveloped presently when she stumbled and staggered down to the cabin and flung herself face downward upon the sofa in a paroxysm of impotent despair death would have delivered her the tempest was her friend and the tempest had passed her by and left her lying there like a weed more worthless than any weed that ever the sea cast up to rot upon the barren rocks yes she was left there left in a life that sin had blighted loathsome to herself hateful to her god she locked herself in the cabin while the hurrying footsteps overhead told her that lostwithiel was working with the sailors an hour later and he was at the cabin door pleading for one kind word entreating her to let him see her were it only for a few moments to know that she was not utterly broken down by the peril she had passed through he pleaded in vain she would give no answer she would speak no word indeed in that dull agony of shame and despair it seemed to her as if a dumb devil had entered into her her parched lips seemed to have lost the power of speech she lay there staring straight before her at all the swinging things on the cedar panel the books and photographs and lamps and frivolities vibrating with every movement of the sea her hands were clenched until the nails cut into the flesh her heart was throbbing with a dull slow beat that made itself torturingly audible did god create his creatures for such agony had she been foredoomed everlastingly in that awful incomprehensible antenatal eternity foredoomed to this fallen state to this unutterable shame hours went by she knew not how again and again lostwithiel came to her door and talked and entreated heaven knows how tenderly with what deep contrition with what fond pleading for pardon but the dumb devil held her still she wrapped herself in a sullen despair not anger for anger is active hers was only a supine resistance at last she heard him come with one of the sailors and she could make out from their whispering talk that they were going to force open the door then she started up in a fury and went and flung herself against the cedar panels if you don't leave me alone in my misery i will kill myself she cried the long night was over and the sun was high it seemed as if they were sailing over a summer sea and through the scuttle-port 
she saw a little foreign town nestling under the shelter of pine-clad hills she woke from brief and troubled slumbers to see this smiling shore and at first she fancied they must have sailed back to cornwall and that this was some unknown bay upon that rock-bound coast but the sapphire sea and the summer-like sunshine suggested a fairer clime than rugged britain while she was looking out at the crescent-shaped bay and the long line of white villas the anchor was being lowered the sea was almost as smooth as a lake and those tranquil waters had the colour and the sheen of sapphire and emerald she thought of the jasper sea the sea of the apocalypse the tideless sea beside that land of the new jerusalem where there are no more tears where there can be no more sin a city of ransomed souls redeemed from all earth's iniquity a boat was being lowered she heard the scroop of the ropes in the davits she heard footsteps on the accommodation ladder and then the dip of oars and presently the boat passed between her and the sunlit waters and she saw lost withiel sitting in the stern with the rudder lines in his hands while two sailors were bending to their oars with wind-blown hair and cheery smiling faces broad and red in the gay morning sunshine he was gone and she breathed more freely there was a sense of release in his absence and for the first time she looked round the cabin where beautiful and luxurious things lay thrown here and there in huddled masses of brilliant colour a japanese screen a masterpiece of rainbow-hued embroidery on a sea-green ground flung against the panelling at one end persian curtains wrenched from their fastenings and hanging awry satin pillows that had drifted into a heap in one corner signs of havoc everywhere she stood in the midst of all this ruin and looked at her own reflection in a venetian glass riveted to the panelling about the only object that had held its place through the storm her own reflection was that really herself that ghastly image which the glass gave back to her the reflection of a woman with livid cheeks and blanched lips with swollen eyelids and dark rings of purple round the haggard eyes and hair rough and tangled as medusa's locks and bare shoulders from which the stained satin bodice had slipped away her wedding gown could that defiled garment the long folds of the once shining satin draggled and dripping with sea-water could these tawdry rags be the wedding gown she had put on in her proud and happy innocence in the old bedroom at deanham with mother and servants and a useful friend or two helping and hindering oh if they could see her now those old friends of her unclouded childhood the mother and father who had loved and trusted her who had never spoken of evil things in her hearing had never thought that sin could come near her and she had fallen like the lowest of womankind she had forfeited her place among the virtuous and happy for ever she martin disney's wife that good man that brave soldier who had fought for queen and country it was his wife who stood there in her shame haggard and dishevelled she flung her arms above her head and wrung her hands in a paroxysm of despair then with a little cry she plucked at the loose wild tresses as if she would have torn them from her head and then she threw herself upon the cabin floor in her agony and grovelled there a creature for whom death would have been a merciful release if i could die if i could but die and no one know she moaned she lifted herself up again upon her knees and with one hand upon the floor looked round the walls of the cabin looked at a trophy of moorish and italian arms which decorated the panelling searching for some sharp dagger with which she might take her hated life and then came the thought of what must follow death 
not for her in the dim incomprehensible eternity but for those who loved her on earth for those who would have to be told how she had been found in her draggled wedding gown stabbed by her own hand on board lord lostwithiel's yacht what a story of shame and crime for newspapers to embellish and for scandal lovers to gloat over no she dared not destroy herself thus she must collect her senses escape from her seducer and keep the secret of her dishonour she took off her gown and rolled train and bodice into a bundle as small as she could make them then she looked about the cabin for some object with which to weight her bundle yes that would do a little brass dolphin that was used to steady the open door that was heavy enough perhaps she put it into the middle of her bundle tied a ribbon tightly round the hole and then she opened the scuttle port and dropped her wedding garment into the sea the keen fresh wind with the wind from pine-clad hills and distant snow mountains blew in upon her bare neck and chilled her but it helped to cool the fever of her mind and she sat down and leaned her head upon her clasped hands and tried to think what she must do to free herself from the toils in which guilty love had caught her she must escape from the yacht she must go back to england somehow she thought that if she were to appeal to lost withiel's honour some spark of better feeling would prevail over that madness which had wrecked her and he would let her go he would take her back to england and facilitate her secret return to the home she had dishonoured but could she trust herself to make that appeal could she stand fast against his pleading if he implored her to stay with him to live the life that he had planned for her the life that he had painted so eloquently the dreamy beautiful life amidst earth's most romantic scenes the life of love in idleness could she resist him if he should plead it might be with tears he whom she adored her destroyer and her divinity no she must leave the yacht before he came back to her but how there were only men on board there was no woman to whose compassion she could appeal no woman to lend her clothes to cover her she saw herself once again in the venetian glass in her long trained petticoat of muslin and lace so daintily fresh when she dressed for the ball muslin and lace soddened by the sea torn to shreds where her feet had caught in the flounces as she stumbled down the companion during last night's storm a fitting costume in which to travel from arachon to london verily she opened a door leading to an inner cabin which contained bed and bath and all toilet appliances hanging against the wall there were three dressing gowns the lightest and least masculine of the three being a robe of indian camel's hair embroidered with grey silk a shapeless garment with loose sleeves and a girdle here within locked doors she made her hurried toilette with much cold water she brushed her long ragged hair with one of the humblest of the brushes she would not take so much as a few drops from the great crystal bottle of eau de cologne which was held in a silver frame suspended from the ceiling nothing of his would she touch nothing belonging to the man who wanted to pour his fortune into her lap to make his life her life his estate her estate his name her name could she but survive the ordeal of the divorce court and shake off old ties she rolled her hair into a large coil at the back of her head she put on the camel's hair dressing gown and tied the girdle round her long slim waist and having done this she looked altogether a different creature from that vision of haggard shame which she had seen just now with loathing she had a curious puritan air in her sad coloured raiment and braided hair scarcely had she finished when she heard the dip of oars 
and looking out in an agony of horror at the apprehension of Lostwithiel's return, she saw a boat laden with two big milliner's baskets, and with a woman sitting in the stern. The men who were rowing this boat were not of the crew of the Vendetta. She had not long to wonder. She unlocked her door, and went into the adjoining cabin, while the boat came alongside, and woman and baskets were hauled upon the deck. Three minutes afterwards the cabin boy knocked at her door, and told her that there was a person from Arcachon to see her, a dressmaker with things that had been ordered for her. She unlocked the door, for the first time since she locked it at dawn, and found herself face to face with a smiling young person, whose black eyes and olive complexion were warm with the glow of the south, golden in the eyes, carnation on the plump oval cheeks. This young person had the honour to bring the trousseau which Monsieur had sent for Madame's inspection. Monsieur had told her how sadly inconvenienced Madame had been by the accident by which all her luggage had been left upon the quay at the moment of sailing. In truth, it must have been distressing for Madame, as it had evidently been distressing for Monsieur in his profound sympathy with Madame, his wife. In the meantime she, the young person, had complied with Monsieur's orders, and had brought all that there was of the best and most delicate and refined for Madame's gracious inspection. The cabin boy brought in the two baskets, which the milliner opened with an air, taking out the delicate lingerie, the soft silk and softer cashmere, peignoirs, frilled petticoats, a fluff and flutter of creamy lace, and pale satin ribbons, transforming simplest garments into things of beauty. She spread out her wares, chattering all the while, and then looked at Madame for approval. Isola scarcely glanced at all the finery. She pointed to the only plain walking gown among all the delicate prettinesses, the silks and cashmeres and laces, a grey tweed tailor gown, with no adornment except a little narrow black braid. "'I will keep that,' she said, "'and one set of underlinen, the plainest. You can take all the rest of the things back to your shop. Please help me to dress as quickly as you can.' I want to go on shore in the boat that takes you back. But, madame, monsieur insisted that I should bring a complete trousseau. He wished madame to supply herself with all things needful for a long cruise in the south. He was mistaken. My luggage is safe enough. I shall have it again in a few days. I only want clothes to wear for a day or two. Kindly do what I ask. Her tone was so authoritative that the milliner complied, reluctantly and murmuring persuasive little speeches while she assisted Madame to dress. All that she had brought was of the most new, expressly arrived from Paris, from one of the most distinguished establishments in the Rue de la Paix. Fashions changed so quickly, and the present fashions were so enchanting, so original. She must be pardoned if she suggested that nothing in Madame's wardrobe could be so new or so elegant as these latest triumphs of an artistic faiseur, Madame took no heed of her eloquence, but hurried through the simple toilette, insisted upon all the finery being replaced in the two baskets, and then went upon deck with the milliner. "'I am going on shore to his lordship,' she said, with quiet authority to the captain. It was a deliberate lie, the first she had told, but not the last she would have to tell. She landed on the beach at Arcachon, penniless but with a diamond ring on her wedding finger, her engagement ring, which she knew, by a careless admission of Martin Disney's, to have cost fifty pounds. She left the milliner and went into the little town, dreading to meet Lostwithiel at every step. She found a complacent jeweller who was willing to advance twenty-five Napoleons upon the ring, and promised to return it to her on the receipt of that sum, with only a bagatelle of twenty francs for interest, since Madame would redeem her pledge almost immediately. Furnished with this money, she drove straight to the station, and waited there in the most obscure corner she could find, till the first train left for Bordeaux. 
at bordeaux she had a long time to wait still in hiding before the express left for paris and then came the long lonely journey from bordeaux to paris from paris to london from london to trelasco it seemed an endless pilgrimage a nightmare dream of dark night and wintry day made hideous by the ceaseless throb of the engine the perpetual odour of sulphur and smoke she reached trelasco somehow and sank exhausted in tabitha's arms what day is it she asked faintly looking round the familiar room as if she had never seen it before thursday madam you have been away ten days the old servant answered coldly it was only the next day that tabitha told her mistress she must leave her there is no need to talk about what has happened she said i have kept your secret i have let no one know that you were away i packed susan off for a holiday the morning after the ball i don't believe any one knows anything about you unless you were seen yesterday on your way home then came stern words of renunciation a conscientious but rather narrow-minded woman's protest against sin end of chapter twenty eight chapter twenty nine of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer painter all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter twenty nine i you and god can comprehend each other it was two months after allegra's wedding day and martin disney had been warned that the closing hour of the young life he had watched so tenderly was not far off it might come to-morrow or it might not come for a week or the lingering flame might go flickering on fainting and reviving in the socket for another month he must hold himself prepared for the worst death might come suddenly at the last like a thief in the night or by stealthy gradual steps and slowest progress from life to clay he sat beside isola's sofa in the roman lodging as he had sat beside her bed in that long illness at trelasco when her wandering mind appalled him more than her bodily weakness he watched as faithfully as he had watched then but this time without hope father rodwell had been with her at seven o'clock upon the last three mornings and had administered the sacrament to her and to her husband and to the faithful tabitha one with them in piety and love the priest thought that each celebration would be the last but she rallied a little as the day wore on and lived till sunset lived through the long painful night and another day dawned and he found her waiting for him in the morning ready to greet him with her pale smile when he appeared upon the threshold of her room after going up the staircase in saddest apprehension dreading to hear that all was over except the funeral service and the funeral bell she insisted upon getting up and going into the drawing-room feeble as she was tabitha was so handy and so helpful that the fatigue of an invalid's toilette was lightened to the uttermost tabitha and the colonel carried her from the bedroom to the drawing-room upon her couch and carried the couch back to the bedside in the evening before noon she was lying in the sunlit salon surrounded with flowers and photographs and books and newspapers and all things that lighten the monotonous hours of sickness nor was companionship ever wanting martin disney devoted himself to her with an unfailing patience upon no pretence would he leave her for more than half an hour at a time just a space of a walk to the hill of gardens or the length of the via de condotti and the corso just the space of a cigar in the loggia he read to her he talked to her 
he waited upon her tabitha and he were her only nurses for lottchen was a young woman of profound concentration of motive and had early taken unto herself the motto one baby one nurse she conscientiously performed her duty to her infant charge but she rarely lifted a finger to help any one else it was drawing towards the end of july the weather had been lovely hitherto hot and very hot but not insupportable for those who could afford to dawdle and sleep away their midday and afternoon existence who had horses to carry them about in the early mornings and a carriage to drive them in moonlit gardens and picturesque places in the suburbs of the great city across the arid campagna yonder at tivoli and frascati and albano and castel gandolfo people had been revelling in the summer living under jove's broad roof with dancing and sports and music and feasting and rustic innocent kisses snatched amidst the darkness of groves whose only lamps are fireflies deep woods of ilex where the nightingale sings long and late and the grasshopper trills his good night through the perfumed herbage here in rome the heat was more oppressive and the splashing of the city's many fountains was the only relief from the glare and dazzle of the piazzas the whiteness of the great blocks of houses in the new streets and boulevards blinds were lowered and shops were shut in the blinding noontide heat and through the early afternoon the eternal city was almost as silent and reposeful as the sleeping beauty to awaken at sundown to movement and life and music and singing in lighted streets and crowded cafes suddenly in the dim grey of the morning the slumberous calm of summer changed to howling wind and tropical rain torrential rain that filled every gutter and splashed from every housetop and ran in wild cascades from every alley on the steep hillsides the campagna was one vast lake illumined with flashes of lightning and the thunder pealed and reverberated along the lofty parapets of the ruined aqueducts the tall cypresses in the pincian gardens bent like saplings before that mighty wind which seemed to howl and shriek its loudest as it came tearing down from the hill to whistle and rave among the housetops in the piazza di spagna one would think the ghost of nero was shrieping in the midst of the tempest said isola as she listened to the fitful sobbing of the wind late in the dull grey afternoon while her husband and father rodwell sat near her couch keeping up that sad pretence of cheerfulness which love struggles to maintain upon the very edge of the grave the broken-hearted make-believe of those who know that death waits at the door there comes a shrill cry every now and then like the scream of a wicked spirit in pain rome is full of ghosts answered the priest but there are the shadows of the good and the great as well as of the wicked walking alone in twilight on the adventine i should hardly be surprised to meet the spirit of gregory the great wandering amidst the scenes of his saintly life nor do i ever go into the pantheon at dusk without half expecting to see the shade of raffaele and there are others some i knew in the flesh wiseman and antonelli gibson the sculptor consummate artist and gentlest of men yes rome is full of the shadows of the good and the wise one can afford to put up with nero you don't mean me to think that you believe in ghosts asked isola deeply interested it was only five o'clock yet the sky was grey with the greyness of late evening here in this land of sunshine there had been all day long the brooding gloom of storm clouds and a sky that was dark as winter i won't analyse my own feelings on the subject i will quote the words of a man at whose feet it was my happiness to sit sometimes when i was a lad at oxford canon mosley has not shrunk from facing the great problem of spiritual life in this world of an invisible after-existence upon the earth when the body is dust 
is the mother of our lord now existing he asks and answers yes i believe that all fathers mothers sons and daughters are now existing nature has disposed of their bodies as far as we can trace her work but their souls remain so i read in homer in virgil and in the new testament this existence i am permitted to believe is a conscious and active existence canon mosley the man who wrote those words and much more in the same strain was not an idle visionary if he could afford to believe in the presence of the dead among us why so can i and i believe that gregory the great has whispered at the ear of many a holy father in the long line of his successors and has influenced many a cardinal's vote and has been an invisible power in many a council i like to believe in ghosts said isola gently but i thank god those that i love are still in this life she held out her hand with a curiously timid gesture to her husband who clasped it tenderly bending his lips to kiss the pale thin fingers oh death pity and pardon are so interwoven with thine image that neither pride nor anger has any force against thy softening influence she had been false she had wronged him and dishonoured herself cruelly cruelly most cruelly but she had suffered and repented and she was passing away from him let the broken spirit pass in peace that day wore itself out in storm and tempest and the night came on like a fierce death struggle and the wind raved and shrieked at intervals all through the night and again next day there were gloom and darkness and a sky heaped up with masses of lead-coloured cloud and again the torrential rain streamed from the housetops and splashed into the streets below a dreary day to be endured even by the healthy and the happy a day of painful oppression for an invalid isola's spirits sank to the lowest depth and for the first time since allegra's marriage she talked hopelessly of their separation if only i could see her once more before i die she sighed my dear love you shall see her as soon as the railway can bring her here remember it is you who have forbidden me to send for her you know how dearly she loves you how willingly she would come to you i'll telegraph to her within half an hour no 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 isola protested hurriedly no we can never meet again in this world i took my farewell of her in the church i meant it to be farewell i was very happy for her sake when i saw her married to the man she loved it was a selfish repining that made me ask for her just now i would not have her summoned here for worlds she is so happy at venice happy in her honeymoon dream tell her nothing martin nothing till you can tell her that my days have ended peacefully she has borne her burden for me in the past i want her to be free from all care about me but not to forget me she will not forget isola she loves you fondly and truly yes i am sure of that she was dearer to me than my own sister cared for me much more than gwendolen ever cared though gwen and i were always good friends poor feather-headed gwen she writes me affectionate letters hoping she may get to italy in the autumn though it is impossible for her to come just now and mother and father write to me just in the same way mother regretting that her health won't allow her to leave Deenan father hoping to see me in the autumn their letters are full of hopefulness she concluded with a faint touch of irony her husband read to her for the greater part of the long gloomy day he read st thomas a kempis for some part of the time the book had been on the little table by her side throughout her illness he read two or three of frederick robertson's sermons and for occasional respite from too serious thought he read her her favourite poems adonais alastor 
and some of Shelley's lovely lyrics, and those passages in Child Harold, which had acquired a new charm for her since she had grown familiar with Rome. "'Read to me about Venice,' she said, "'and let me think of Allegra and Captain Hulbert. I love to fancy them gliding along those narrow, picturesque streets in the great, graceful, ponderous gondola I remember so well. It is so nice to know of their happiness, and to know that they need never be parted. So the long summer day, without the glow and glory of summer, wore on, and except for her excessive languor and feebleness, there were no indications that the patient's state was any worse than it had been for some weeks. The doctor came late in the afternoon and felt her pulse, and talked to her a little, but it was easy to see that his visit was only a formula. "'You have such an excellent nurse, Mrs. Disney, that I consider my position almost a sinecure,' he said, smiling at the faithful Tabitha, who stood waiting for his instructions, and who never forgot the minutest detail. Tabitha came in from the adjoining bedroom every now and then, and adjusted the pillows on the sofa, and sprinkled eau de cologne, or fanned the invalid with a large Japanese fan, or arranged the silken coverlet over her feet, or brought her some small refreshment in the way of a cup of soup or jelly, and tenderly coaxed and assisted her to take it, talking just as much or as little as seemed prudent, always careful neither to fatigue nor excite her charge. It was between eight and nine in the evening, and there was a gloomy twilight in the loggia and in the garden beyond. The wind which had dropped in the afternoon had begun to rage again, as if not only Nero, but all the wicked emperors were abroad in the air. Isola had begged that one of the windows might be opened, in spite of the tempestuous weather, and the cold, damp breath of the storm crept into the room and chilled Martin Disney as he sat by his wife's sofa, reading a London paper that had come by the evening post. The only artificial light in the room was a reading lamp at the Colonel's elbow, shaded from the draught by the four-leaved screen which protected the invalid. The gloomy grey daylight had not quite faded, and through the half-open door opposite him Martin Disney saw the white marble wall of the staircase, and some oleanders in stone vases that stood on the spacious landing. He had been reading to Isola nearly all day. He was reading to himself now, trying to forget his own grief in the consideration of a leading article which prophesied a European war and the ultimate extinction of English influence in continental politics. There was perfect stillness in the room, Isola had been lying with closed eyes a little time before, and he fancied that she was sleeping. The silence had lasted for nearly an hour, broken only by the shriek of the wind and by the chiming of the quarters from the church of La Trinità di Monti, when Colonel Disney was startled by his wife's hand clutching his arm and his wife's agitated whisper sounding close to his ear. "'Martin, did you see him?' She had lifted herself into a sitting position, she who had not been able to sit up for many days past. The hectic bloom had faded from her cheeks and left them ashy pale. Her eyes seemed almost starting from her head, straining their gaze as if to penetrate the deepening shadows on the landing beyond the half-open door. "'My love, you have been dreaming,' said Disney, soothing her with womanly gentleness. "'Lie down again, my poor dear. See, let me arrange the pillows and make you quite comfortable.' "'No, no, I was not dreaming. I have not been asleep. He was there. I saw him as plainly as I see you. He pushed the door a little further open and looked in at me. I saw his face in the lamplight, very pale.' Disney glanced at the door involuntarily. "'Yes?' The aperture was certainly wider than when he looked at it last, just as if someone's hand had pushed the door a little further back. The hand of the wind, no doubt. My dear girl, believe me, you were dreaming. No one could have approached that doorway without my hearing them. 
I've been lying awake thinking all the time you have been reading your paper, Martin. I never had less inclination to sleep. I know that he was there looking in at me, with a smile upon his pale face. But he has gone. Thank God he has gone. Only I can't help wondering how he came there, without our hearing his step upon the stone stair. Who was it, Isola? He knew what the answer would be. He thought her mind was wandering, and he knew there was only one image which could so agitate her. Lost with you. A delusion, Isa. Lord Lost with you is far away from Rome. Come, dear love, let me read to you again, and let us have our good Tabitha in to cheer you with a cup of tea, and to brighten up the room a little. We have been growing low-spirited under the influence of the gloomy weather. He went out of the room on pretense of summoning Tabitha, and having sent her to watch beside his wife, he ran quickly downstairs to find out if the street door were open or closed. The door was shut and bolted. The servants on the ground floor had not opened the door to anyone after five o'clock. There was no possibility of any stranger having entered the house since that hour. The end came that night with an appalling suddenness. Isola had refused to be carried back to her bedroom at the usual time. She seemed to have a horror of going back to that room, as if the shadows lurking there were full of fear. Even Father Rodwell's presence, which generally had a soothing effect upon her nerves and spirits, failed to comfort her to-night. She refused to lie in her usual position, and insisted upon sitting up, supported by pillows, facing the doorway at which her fancy had evoked Lost Withiel's image. She would not allow the door to be shut, and there was the same strained look in her two brilliant eyes all the evening. Father Rodwell read aloud to her, continuing a history of St. Cecilia, in which she had been warmly interested, but to-night he could see that her thoughts were not with the book. He read on all the same, hoping that the sound of his voice might lull her to sleep. The wind had gone down as the night advanced, and the stars were shining in the strip of sky above the Pinchian gardens. Colonel Disney was pacing up and down the loggia, smoking his pipe in the cool darkness, full of saddest apprehensions. Her mind had been wandering, surely, when she had that fancy about Lost with you, he told himself. It was something more than a dream. And then he remembered those long nights of delirium after her boy was born, and above all, that one night, when she had fancied herself at sea in a storm, when she had tried to fling herself overboard, he knew now what scene she had re-enacted in that delirium, what the vision was which a mind distraught had conjured out of empty darkness. The priest left them before eleven o'clock, and Martin Disney sat with his wife till long after midnight, Tabitha waiting quietly in the next room, before he could persuade her to go to bed. Isola was more wakeful than usual, though her slumbers had been much broken of late, and there was a restlessness about her which impressed her husband as a sign of evil. "'Is the storm over?' she asked, by and by, with her face turned towards the loggia and the starlight above the garden. "'Yes, dearest, all is calm now.' "'And the boy?' she said, suddenly looking up at the ceiling above which the child slept with his nurse. "'He is asleep, of course.' "'I hope so. I went upstairs at nine o'clock, while Father Rodwell was reading to you, and gave him my good-night kiss. He was fast asleep. "'I wonder whether he will ever think of me when he is a man,' she said musingly. "'Can you doubt that? You will be his most sacred memory.' "'Ah,' she replied, "'he will never know.' The sentence remained unfinished. "'Do you carry me to my bed, Martin? The room begins to grow dark.' she whispered faintly. I can hardly see your face. He lifted the wasted form in his arms, and carried her with tenderest care into the next room, and to the pure white bed which had been made ready for her, the long net curtains parted, the coverlet turned down. He laid her there, as he had done many a night, 
during that slow and monotonous journey towards the grave but her gentle acknowledgment of his carefulness was wanting to-night her head sank upon the pillow her pale lips parted with a fluttering sigh and all was still this was how the end came suddenly painlessly she died like an infant falling asleep colonel disney laid his wife in the place she had loved the cemetery under the shadow of the old roman wall in a verdant corner near shelley's grave burial follows death with dreadful swiftness in that southern land and the earth closed over isola before noon of the day after her death martin disney waited to see the new-made grave covered with summer's loveliest blossoms before he left the cemetery and went back to the house to which he had taken his fading wife in the radiant italian springtime he paced the desolate rooms and wandered in and out between the drawing-room and the sunny bedroom with its snowy curtained bed and looked at this object and that with tear-dimmed eyes and aching heart she was gone that page of his life was closed for ever and now he had but one purpose and one desire to settle his account with the scoundrel who had destroyed her he had waited till she was at rest and now the long agony of waiting was over nothing could touch her more and he was free to bring her seducer to book he had telegraphed in the morning to captain hulbert at venice but there had been no reply so far and he could only suppose that allegra and her husband had left the city upon one of those excursions which his sister had described to him as diversifying their quiet life in their palace on the grand canal he had not been at home long and his tired eyes were still dazed and blinded by the flood of sunlight which the servants had let in upon the rooms after the funeral when a telegram was brought to him it was from brindisi the eurydice went down with all hands last night off smyrna my brother was on board i am on my way to greece if you can be spared go to allegra halbert martin knew later that it was between eight and nine o'clock that the eurydice struck upon a rock and every soul on board her perished the boy and his nurse went back to trelasco under tabitha's escort and they were followed to cornwall soon afterwards by the new lord lostwithiel and his wife who established themselves at the mount to the great satisfaction of the neighbourhood where it was felt that the local nobleman had again become a permanent institution allegra and her husband took martin disney's son under their protection in the absence of his father who carried a heavy heart back to the jungle and the tent trying to find distraction and forgetfulness in the pursuit of big game and who did not revisit the angler's nest till two years after his wife's death when he returned to live a tranquil life among the books in the library which he had built for himself and to watch the growth of his son whose every look and tone recalled the image of his dead wife sometimes on drowsy summer afternoons smoking his pipe under the tulip tree while the foy river rippled by in the sunshine it seemed to him as if isola's pensive loveliness and the years that he had lived with her and the tears that he had shed for her and the infinite pity which had blotted out all sense of his deep wrong were only the transient phases of a long sad dream the dream of a love that never was returned and yet and yet he said to himself after lengthened meditation with unseeing eyes fixed upon the movement of the tide i think she loved me i think her heart was mine from the hour her tears welcomed me back to this house until her last sigh god help all young wives whom their husbands leave alone in their youth and beauty to stand or fall in the hour of temptation idly exploring the contents of the secretaire in the drawing-room one day martin disney found the telegraphic message which his wife had written and left unsent 
before the hunt ball end of chapter twenty nine end of all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon